Number 10, Superman. I mean, hate is a really strong word, especially if we're talking about the relationship between Clark and Bruce. However, you likely clicked for the hate, so it's kind of my job to give that to you. While Superman and Batman are generally like BFFs for life, even BFFs have those moments where they really question, you know, why they ever became friends in the first place. I know I've had those moments myself with my BFFs, and it turns out so have Bruce and Cal. There have been a few instances where Superman has really questioned Batman's judgment, and he even once voted to have him kicked off of the Justice League for just that. This was during Tower of Babel, though really Superman was more disappointed in Batman than anything else. I mean, I think most of the Justice League's members were, and as a result, Batman was successfully removed from the roster and his position as team leader. There is also, of course, a whole other universe where these two genuinely did come to hate each other. That is the Injustice universe, where Superman, in essence, became a dictator after being broken mentally by the Joker and kind of turned into a villain as a result of that. Batman refused to join Superman's side in this universe, making the two ultimately enemies. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love or sometimes maybe love to hate Batman, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 9, Green Lantern Jon Stewart. Definitely one of the smaller moments, I would say, of hate on this list. Jon Stewart at one point was leader of the Justice League, which is awesome for him, but maybe, you know, not so great for Batman, who for a long time has been known as the League's often de facto leader, and who kind of has a thing about like, always being in control, always needing to be in control. That's Batman for you. During John's time as leader in Justice League issue number 40, we see this struggle between these two, with Batman struggling to accept his role as a team member as opposed to a leader, and often questioning John's leadership and judgment, causing Green Lantern John Stewart, in turn, to question whether or not Batman should basically even remain on this team. Which honestly, to be fair, yeah, I'm kind of on John's side with this one. Batman shouldn't be undermining John. It's not very cool. Batman wouldn't like it people were doing that to him. Number 8, Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. Even in the main continuity, I would say that Bruce Wayne's Batman and Hal Jordan's Green Lantern are, you know, kind of opposites. However, that doesn't mean they don't see eye to eye all the time. Many times they do, as they are both superheroes who, of course, are both out there fighting for justice. The difference is that Batman prefers to operate outside of the law and kind of in the shadows, whereas Hal literally wields light as a weapon for the law. He is the law as a Green Lantern, and on an intergalactic level, whereas Batman is honestly more of a street level superhero or vigilante, the polar opposite basically. However, there is a reality where their differences make it almost impossible for them to see eye to eye, Frank Miller's Earth 31. Here Batman at one point gets Robin to help him paint an entire safe house yellow while sporting yellow versions of their suits and consuming yellow food and drink just to get Hal Jordan off of his case. The two even fight with Batman using the color yellow yellow to basically taunt Hal by exposing his weakness to it, which is also in stark contrast to the main continuity where Hal before has even stated that Batman's fear tactics don't actually work on him pretty much because he is such a powerful and unstoppable Green Lantern. Number 7, Peacemaker. While everyone might be focused on the end of the Blue Beetle trailer and what Hamie's uncle said about Batman, we actually do have some straight up hate from the DCU when it comes to heroes who actually hate Batman. So far, it actually isn't Blue Beetle or even Blue Beetle's uncle, although Blue Beetle's uncle is also not technically a superhero, I don't think, but it's Peacemaker and, you know, maybe briefly Superman in the DCEU. Remember in one of the episodes of the first season of Peacemaker when Chris went on a whole rant to his dad's neighbor? basically calling Batman out as weak in comparison to himself as a hero? I remember that. That was some hate right there. <laughs> pretty sure Peacemaker pretty much hates everybody on the Justice League though. Number 6, Green Goblin and Hobgoblin. When the first Green Goblin, Norman Osborn, was presumed dead, one of his weapon stashes was found by Roderick Kingsley, a businessman and a criminal. He used the weapons and the journals he found to craft a villainous persona of his own, the Hobgoblin. When Norman read about this new goblin, he almost left his hiding spot in Europe to destroy Kingsley, enraged that someone had stolen his gimmick. When Osborne finally did return to New York, Kingsley was in prison, and he became enraged that Norman was living a life of luxury while he rotted in jail. He got word to Norman that he had a journal that proved Norman was the Green Goblin, and Norman was forced to break Roderick out of jail so he could get his hands on the infamous journal. The entire time they were working together, they were planning on betraying each other 
other. And when Hobgoblin discovered that Osborne had taken over his companies and the majority of his fortune, the two psychos did battle, each intending to destroy the other. In the years since, the two have come to blows a few different times, never being able to bury their hatred for each other. Number 5. Lex Luthor and General Zod Lex Luthor has hated Superman for a variety of reasons over the years. In the classic Superman stories, he held Superman responsible for making him bald. In others, he felt that Superman humiliated him at their first meeting. Sometimes it's narcissism, making him hate anyone who is more beloved than him, and often it is because he believes that Kryptonians make humanity weak and compliant. He hates Superman because he is an alien god who he doesn't trust. Which is why it shouldn't be surprising that Lex also hates the Kryptonian General Zod. In the last Son of Krypton arc, General Zod comes to Metropolis and takes it over, capturing the Justice League and banishing Superman to the Phantom Zone. Now. Lex isn't the type to allow some filthy alien to take over his hometown, and also sensing an opportunity to be seen as the city's savior, he assembles a team to defeat Zod and his men and send them back to the Phantom Zone. He is so intent on getting rid of Zod that when Superman returns, Lex even teams up with the Man of Steel to save the city, retaking the Fortress of Solitude by his side. Of course, he eventually tries to betray Superman, but he was smart enough to know Zod was the priority. Number four. Or Joker and Bane. In another of Bane's plans to break Batman, he took over the city and held Alfred the Butler hostage. When Robin tried to get into Gotham, he was captured and Bane broke Alfred's neck in front of the boy Wonder, killing the Butler. This of course earned him hatred from Batman, Robin, and the entire Bat family. But also someone rather unexpected, the Joker. In the first issue of Joker Warzone, the clown prince of crime breaks into Arkham Asylum where Bane is hooked up to a machine that is draining him of his venom. Joker lets Bane know that he is angry because Alfred was Bruce's last parental figure and that hurting him would have hurt Batman more than anything else. And Bane chose to kill him in front of Robin instead of Batman. Joker hates Bane for wasting the best weapon that could ever be used against the Bat. Joker calls Bane pathetic and vows that someday, when he least expects it, he will kill him. Number 3. Red Hulk and the Abomination Thunderbolt Ross has been a longtime enemy of the Hulk, and was certainly an antagonist to the Green Goliath, but wasn't much of an outright villain. I mean, sure, he did try to shoot Bruce Banner on his wedding day, but these things happen. He did eventually become more villainous after the villain known as the Abomination killed his daughter, Betty. Around this same time, the Hulk was sent off planet by the Illuminati, and Ross felt like he had no purpose until he was approached by the villain group, the Intelligentsia. They offered him the means to have gamma powers if he agreed to work for them. He agreed and was transformed into the Red Hulk, a villainous variation on the original. He wasted no time in hunting down the Abomination, finding him in a small Russian village, and attacking him, beating him to a pulp for what he did to Betty. The fight resulted in the village and all of its inhabitants being killed, but Ross didn't care, and even ended the fight by shooting and killing Blonsky with a gamma pistol. Ross eventually left the Intelligentsia and operates in a bit more of a grey area now, but his final confrontation with Abomination stands out as a fun start to his career as a Hulk. Number 2. Venom and Carnage After Eddie Brock was put in jail, he was made cellmates with notorious mass murderer Cletus Cassidy. The two did not get along, with Eddie despising Cletus for his twisted history and worldview, and Eddie decided to brutally beat him several times while they were imprisoned together. Cletus planned to murder Brock one night, but was interrupted when the Venom symbiote broke Eddie out of jail. The symbiote was pregnant and gave birth to the Carnage symbiote that bonded with Cletus, creating a villain that was even more powerful than Spider-Man and Venom. Venom, although a murderous villain at this point in his history, was extremely reverent to innocent lives and hated Carnage so much that he even teamed up with Spider-Man, his arch enemy, to help the webbed wall crawler take out Cletus and his symbiote. Venom is now more of an anti-hero than villain, but his rivalry with Carnage has been a consistent element of the character to this very day. Number 1. Magneto and the Red Skull Magneto was a Jewish man who lost his entire family and was sent to Auschwitz by the Germans during World War II. The Red Skull was a high-ranking member of the National Socialist German Workers Party, whose more commonly used name I'm not allowed to say on this channel, so it makes sense that Magneto would really hate the Red Skull's guts. We witnessed this 
this. In Captain America number 367, when the Red Skull was suddenly attacked in his office by the Master of Magnetism. Magneto demanded to know if Red Skull was the same Red Skull who was operating during World War II. Upon Red Skull's confirmation that he was the same man, Magneto informed him that he had sworn revenge against anyone who had been involved with the German army in World War II. Seemingly unable to read the room, Red Skull decides that this is the moment to pull a we're not so different you and I, and points out that Magneto's willingness to kill humans who he considers inferior to mutants in order to further the advancement of his people who he considers a master race makes him pretty hypocritical. Magneto is not a fan of this admittedly kind of valid point and responds by capturing Red Skull and locking him in a bomb shelter all alone with no means of escape and nothing to survive on but 10 gallons of water. Magneto tells Red Skull that he wants to make him suffer as he made others suffer during the war and that he is going to wish that he had killed him. He then leaves him to his fate alone in the dark. Number 10, Green Arrow. Green Arrow is sometimes known to take issue with Superman in the sense that he feels the hero is far too powerful to really connect with humanity, seeing him as somewhat dangerous and aloof. This makes some sense when you consider that Oliver Queen, in contrast to Superman, is very much a street level superhero, quite literally a Robin Hood of sorts. Although there is irony in this kind of concern coming from Queen, considering that Ollie is also not quite your commonplace man of the people in regards to his station in life and usually, you know, the vast wealth connected with his name. In Dark Knights of Steel, however, this criticism makes quite a bit more sense with the medieval Green Arrow of this universe being a commoner in contrast to King Jor-El and his son, Prince Kal-El. And this version of Ali is not afraid to showcase his thoughts when it comes to the tyrannical hold he feels the House of El has on the kingdom. Oliver Queen coming for the royals. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love when we talk about superhero beef, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up, or if you just like when I say superhero beef. Number 9, The Flash. Hate might be a strong word to describe the tension between Superman and Barry Allen's The Flash, although if you know me, you know that for me, hate is always a strong word. Instead, I would say these two have more of a rivalry, if you will, often racing one another, and with The Flash kind of gloating that he's simply too fast for Superman to catch. Barry's always like, no one can touch me, I'm the fastest man alive. Which makes Barry somewhat of a perfect match, you'd think, for the Man of Steel. Of course, this claim hasn't always been true has it. There are times the two have been forced to fight against one another and Superman has actually managed to get his hands on Barry, or at least his finger. While it hasn't always worked out in his favor, especially if he's going up against Superman, The Flash sometimes feels as though his way of dealing with crime is somewhat superior to Superman's, or at the very least that it is somewhat oddly underappreciated by his fellow Justice League member Kal-El. Number 8, Martian Manhunter. What's Martian Manhunter's beef with Superman? Well. Nothing super specific, to be honest. It's more like a hodgepodge collection of things that have contributed to some tension between the two superheroes over time. It's less the Martian Manhunter hates Superman, and more that they occasionally do butt heads. For the most part, though, John Johns tends to be a pretty calm, cool, and collected type, and isn't prone to striking out against his colleagues. That's just not who he is. However, it also has been shown that he is somewhat jealous of Superman, and resents the love that people show for Clark over him. At at least that seems to be what is implied when he returns as a Black Lantern after dying as showcased during the Blackest Night event in issue number 44 of the 2005 Green Lantern series. It's like literally lifting buildings up and being like, I'm as strong as Superman. I don't know, seems like he's got some issues, but he doesn't want to talk about them when he's alive, only when he's a Black Lantern. Number seven, Booster Gold. Another hero who would probably be a lot less timid when it comes to his dislike of Superman, or rather the praise that Superman often gets in comparison, is Booster Gold. For Booster, his jealousy probably comes from more of a place of insecurity than Martian Manhunter's jealousy. I don't think John is necessarily insecure, but he's more like deep down, rightfully kind of frustrated that he's constantly living in the shadow of another alien superhero who he feels, you know, he's on a similar level to. And honestly, while Martian Manhunter might not be as popular with comic book fans in comparison to Superman, based on what I know at least of his power set, I would agree. Booster Gold already comes with self-esteem issues right out of his origin. He became a hero in an attempt to redeem himself, so, I mean, of course, he's not going to be the most secure about his status as a hero. And add in the fact that he is often 
the butt of people's jokes in the DC universe and is not taken as seriously as a hero and it makes sense that he'd have some disdain for Superman and all the love the hero receives by comparison. Number 6 Supergirl Supergirl and Batman have pretty much always had a tense relationship, or at least a version of Batman and Supergirl have. This is also made more confusing by the fact that this Supergirl first appeared in a canonically debated series I'd say, Superman slash Batman by Jeff Lowe. While some things were incorporated into the canon from this series, some didn't quite fit with the rest of what was happening in the main continuity at that time. So although this series seems to be acknowledged as canon by pretty much all the wikis on the internet, it's it still has been a debated topic among fans. DC does this basically sometimes with series that are super loved. When asked if those stories are canon later by fans, they often answer them with the question of, well I mean like what do you think, should this be canon? So we kind of decide what's canon and what's not and they kind of just take the bits and pieces that they like the most. And then from there certain things are just like incorporated into the canon. Like with Alan Moore's The Killing Joke and you know what happened to Barbara there. Anyways, Batman and kind of newer Supergirls beef comes from the fact that when she first arrives in Superman slash Batman, she causes quite the stir after exiting her ship, which Batman finds in Gotham. Naked and confused, Kara wanders around and basically causes all kinds of destruction. Now add in the facts that Superman was initially believed to be the last surviving Kryptonian, Kara's anger issues, and the fact that she turns evil more than once, and I mean it kind of makes sense that her and Batman would not get along. He kind of doesn't really trust her and as a result she kind of doesn't really like Batman. She's like this guy is just a big jerky jerk and he doesn't get me. Number 5, Wonder Woman. Might be a shocking one for people that I put Wonder Woman at 5, but let me tell you about it. Wonder Woman and Batman are generally seen as of course being potential romantic interests for one another, as well as usually being depicted as like very close friends. So you know, it might surprise you to hear the hatred between them. Of course, this isn't really in the main continuity. Now there, they generally admire and respect one another, despite being very different heroes I'd say. And despite the fact that Wonder Woman as an Amazon does not have any qualms with killing, unlike Batman, who that's like a huge huge no no for Batman. However, even in the main continuity they have had their differences, like in Greg Rucka's and J.G. Jones's Wonder Woman story, The Hikatea, where the two are actually forced to fight over the fate of a woman who has sought Diana's protection. There are also other realities where their fighting has been much less incidental, which is kind of what we're focused on here, such as the reality belonging to Superman Red Sun. Here on what we know as Earth 30, Wonder Woman is in love with Superman, who here was actually raised in Russia, so he's a Russian Superman, and ends up being used as bait by the Russian Batman who seeks to destroy Superman. During this fight, Wonder Woman is forced to break her lasso of truth, which causes her to basically age. While she resents Superman for this later on, it's fair to say that she would also probably hate Batman as well, as he was the one who incapacitated her in the first place. Number 4, Catwoman. It might seem odd to you for me to have Catwoman on my list for a few reasons. I mean, is Catwoman a superhero? And does she not love Batman? Well, I would personally argue that yes, she is a hero more often than not, at least in modern comics, and I would also kind of agree that yes, she does love Batman as well. However, that doesn't mean that she hasn't also hated Batman at the same time in the past. In fact, she literally has done that. Check out issue number 355 of Batman, where when Batman leaves her for Vicky Vale, she confesses to basically just that. Basically, like literally says, like, I'm in love with you, but I also hate you for kind of like what you did to me, you abandoned me. So, kind of classic Catwoman. I think. Bit of a love-hate thing they have going. Number 3, Spawn. Spawn and Batman had a team up at one point in the crossover issue Spawn slash Batman from 1994. Not to be confused with their recent team up from 2022, Batman slash Spawn. Very different, as you can tell from that title. And although this Batman definitely does not seem like our main continuity Batman, possibly because he's being written by Frank Miller here, he and Spawn both had a huge fight in this crossover, with both of them wanting to basically actively harm the other. Bury this. This. That's me throwing a batarang because that happens at the end of the comic. Number 2, Rick Flagg. Rick Flagg Jr. is often known for his role in the Suicide Squad team, generally acting as their field commander on behalf of Amanda Waller. Initially, Rick respected Batman. Rick even offers a team up to the Dark Knight during a rescue mission to save Nemesis from a Russian prison, which they're both on with their own separate teams. Batman with Justice League International and Rick with the Suicide 
Suicide Squad. When Batman turns him down though, things quickly escalate and the two break out into a literal physical fight. It all starts with Rick trying to be like, Batman, don't walk away from me, let's have a conversation. Then it's like, nope, now we're fighting. Number 1 Green Lantern Guy Gardner While alternate Superman might take the cake for hating Batman and a slew of other superheroes who stood in his way in the Injustice universe, I would say like, honestly, if we're talking alt universes, it's one of the worst. This is, at the end of the day, an alternate reality still. So Guy Gardner is ranking much higher for the fact that the conflict between Batman and Guy was very real in the main continuity, and even at one point culminated in a fight between them. A one punch fight too, oh boy. Guy challenged Batman for leadership of the Justice League, took off his Green Lantern ring, and then was pretty much defeated in one punch by Batman. That'll probably make you hate someone, you know, at least for a while. Although I think Guy's over it at this point. Number 10, Medusa. You could argue that Medusa really hated the X-Men at one point. Adam talked a bit about the Inhumans vs X-Men event on part 1 of this list. While Black Bolt is their king, Medusa is or was at the time their queen. She herself had a pretty feisty exchange with Emma Frost during the conflict who was leading her own team of X-Men, with the two women's conflict coming to blows and them actually fighting one another directly during the Inhumans vs X-Men story. Following that conflict being resolved, Medusa even stepped down from her role as queen as a result. That's how much this whole thing affected her. The conflict with the X-Men left her feeling as though she had failed her own people by leading them into this war. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. Thank you. Number 9, War Machine. There was a time when War Machine actually led his own team of Sentinels against mutants, or at least to observe and track mutants, which is still pretty bad, honestly. Sounds shocking, right? But it's true. He was chosen to become the direct commanding officer of his own Sentinel squad. Most Sentinels, of course, don't need a commanding officer because they themselves are like AI robots, which are used to attack and target mutant kind. But in this case, the Sentinels in question were piloted armor. The squad was known as Sentinel Squad. One, O N E, and they were part of one, which stands for Office of National Emergency. One was basically activated by the President of the United States following the events of M Day. While Rhodey himself is not known for really hating mutants, his actions here were definitely antagonistic towards them, even if he didn't perhaps see it that way at the time or intend it to be like that. I mean, you know, to Rhodey, he's just working with the government, but also, I don't know, man, I feel like if you're watching mutants, that's pretty messed up. Number eight, Doctor Strange. What? The X Men and Doctor Strange have beef? When? How? Why? Well, we're not talking about Stephen Strange here, but former Doctor Strange, Clea Strange, the wife of Stephen. The sort of wife of Stephen. Sort of. It's complicated. Basically his longtime love interest, who he is separated from, but who every now and then comes back to remind everyone, you know, she's still his wife, even though th that point kind of seems murky at best, and I don't think they were ever actually formerly married, but you know, they do, or did, have rings. So, yeah. Clea during the Hellfire Gala of 2022 had some very tense moments with the mutants, not really specifically the X-Men as they stand now, but at least a former member of the X-Men, Emma Frost. Clea came to the gala and requested to speak to Emma in the hopes that she might be able to help her resurrect Steven, who had recently died during the events of the death of Doctor Strange. It had just been revealed to the world that mutant kind had the power to basically bring back their dead, and Clea was basically hoping they might be able to help her in reviving Steven. But of course, Emma refused. Instead actually suggesting that maybe Clea would be a better Sorcerer Supreme than her husband was. Now, despite this being technically a compliment, Clea did not take the response very well. She was actually pretty peeved. Number 7, Alpha Flight. After consulting with our resident Alpha Flight expert, Andrew, I learned that as I suspected, Alpha Flight has had beef with the X-Men, mainly involving Wolverine. Despite the fact that Wolverine himself has been a member of Alpha Flight, the team have also constantly made attempts to kidnap Wolverine and take him back to Canada, because they basically have seen him as essentially government property. Well, that doesn't sound very polite or very Canadian-like to me as a fellow Canadian, but that's basically the tea there. Eventually, Wolverine and Alpha Flight would work things out, and currently they are on very good terms with the Knucklehead, but there was a time when they had a very real problem with the X-Men and some serious jealousy issues, it seems, in regards to their attachment to Wolverine, which I mean, I kinda get. Wolverine's pretty cool. <laughs> if he was on my team too and he was like, hey, I'm leaving, I'd be like, no, get back here. I don't know if I'd kidnap him though. I feel like that's not very nice. Shouldn't go around kidnapping people. Number six, Shazam. Typically, Shazam 
Sam, aka the formerly known Captain Marvel, aka Billy Batson, is often portrayed as someone who looks up to Superman. Although that isn't to say that they don't have their moments where they do kind of compete against each other because, well I mean as fans, we like to be like, who's more powerful? In the Injustice universe though, despite following Superman, at one point Shazam also tries to act as a voice of reason when he actually kind of questions Superman's judgment. Seeing this as a challenge to his authority though, Superman reacts pretty dramatically by basically killing Shazam, focusing his heat vision on Shazam's eyes until his head basically melts. Sounds like a pretty terrible way to go, not gonna lie. Looks like a pretty terrible way to go in that comic too. Number five, Hercules. Calling Hercules a hero is somewhat debatable. It kinda depends on which period in this history we're referring to. In the early days though, Hercules was definitely marketed as a hero. In fact, while I'm more familiar with him as somewhat of a villain in Amazonian history, he initially was portrayed as being a captive of the Amazons held against his will, who simply tricked Hippolyta into giving him her girdle so he might escape imprisonment. Although, you know, then he also took it out on the Amazons, that whole thing, and that's, that's a whole other thing. Even back then, he really did seem to uh, hate the Amazons. Although perhaps in that story was some good reason since, you know, he was their prisoner. With Superman, his hatred of the hero came from a love of Lois Lane when Hercules found himself transported to the future, Superman's present day in the 20th century. However, this brief encounter likely wouldn't be remembered by Hercules today since he was kind of made to forget all about it when he traveled back to his own time. So yeah. But that was the thing, he loved Lois Lane for a, a minute. Number four, Green Lantern. Guy Gardner once had his own series where he decided to actually pick a fight with Superman. And this actually wasn't the first time these two would fight either. For Guy, this was a rematch that he wanted because the last time they fought, Superman basically trounced him. Although we often know him as the hero Green Lantern, this was during a time when Guy was actually wearing a yellow ring. Having powered up his ring through fighting Green Lanterns, which is how it seems to charge, at least here, Guy heads to Earth to fight against Superman. However, even Guy finds it challenging to commit to a battle against Supes. You see, right around this time, the Justice League was also kind of fighting Doomsday, so Guy ultimately heads to Earth to fight Superman, and then ultimately ends up joining in the fight against Doomsday, and you know, if you've heard of the Death of Superman storyline, I think you know how that all goes. Not very well for almost everyone involved, because Doomsday is insane. Number three, Wonder Woman. In the Superman Red Sun universe, Wonder Woman actually starts out as an ally of Superman's and even falls in love with him. So where does it all go wrong here? In the Red Sun universe, we explore a world where Superman is actually an agent of the Soviet Union, having landed there instead of in America when he fell to Earth. Wonder Woman and Superman are involved in a relationship that is mainly fueled by politics, uniting both the strength of the Soviet Union with that of Themyscira and the Amazons. However, when Superman is taken prisoner by his world's Batman, Wonder Woman rushes in to save him. In the end, this rescue attempt costs her pretty dearly, with Wonder Woman being forced to break her lasso after being restrained by it and therefore as a result losing her immortality and her eternal youth. Despite initially loving Superman, because of this Wonder Woman's love turns to, well, kind of hate and she never really fully forgives him for what happened to her as a result of his own capture. Number two, Batman. Batman and Superman are often known for being best friends in the main continuity. I mean Clark was asked to be Bruce's best man at his wedding. The wedding to Selina Kyle aka Catwoman which of course ended up not really happening and getting called off, but still, this just goes to show how close the two of them are. So how could Batman hate Superman? Well, in an alternate reality known as Injustice or Injustice Gods Among Us, full title, Superman ends up becoming a ruthless tyrant after losing Metropolis and his family, Lois Lane and their future child together. What's worse was Superman was the one to take Lois's life thanks to the machinations of Joker and Harley Quinn. This causes Superman to snap, killing the Joker and setting out to control the world in response, starting a full out unforgiving war on crime. Batman however in this universe disagrees with Clark's approach, seeing him for what he is, a controlling and unforgiving tyrant who has been basically driven mad with power as a result of his loss. This causes a divide between the two with Batman gathering his own team to combat Superman and the heroes who follow him. Number one, Black Canary. I forgot about this one and then I was like, oh yeah, that's a good one. Also thank you to Adam for the suggestion when I was asking for some folks to 
give me some ideas because this list stumped me a bit. I was like, but everyone loves Superman. Except for me, I guess. I find Superman to be a little boring, but obviously I haven't read the right Superman stories, I think. Black Canary has some pretty big and honestly understandable beef with Superman in the Injustice universe. Like many heroes, Black Canary is one of those who stands against Superman, attempting at one point to help defeat him. And she actually does like pretty good too, I gotta say. However, unlike some of the other superheroes who rally against Clark in this universe, for Black Canary, her hatred of the Man of Steel is quite personal because he took from her the one man she loved, Green Arrow, Oliver Queen. Which also makes this battle between them like a lot more intense in a good way. And at 10, Quicksilver. The Flash is known as the fastest character in DC Comics, and while Superman may come close, he doesn't hold the title of fastest man alive. Over in Marvel Comics, however, that title belongs to Quicksilver, a mutant hero with an arrogant demeanor and formidable speed. He rarely meets anyone or anything that can challenge his velocity until the DC vs Marvel crossover event where he faced off against the Flash. Yes, this actually happened. At the beginning of their battle, the two heroes were evenly matched, but Quicksilver briefly gains the upper hand, however it doesn't last long as Flash's speed proves to be too much for Quicksilver to handle. The Flash secures his victory with relative ease. Though they team up later in the series, Quicksilver can't seem to shake his resentment towards the Flash for being faster than him. The Flash is the undisputed fastest character in DC Comics, so yeah, yeah I mean, like, it, it makes sense. He proved to be even faster than Quicksilver, Marvel's fastest character. Yeah, I can understand the resentment. I mean, if you think that you're the fastest and then they prove that you're not, it makes you a little bit bitter. In at 9, The Flash. I run Ironically enough, one of the superheroes who hates the Flash is actually the Flash. And I'm not talking about like Wally hating Barry's version, I'm talking Barry Allen getting so mad at himself that he travels back in time to kill his younger version. This is a thing, guys. Th this is comics. While Savitar was introduced as the future Flash in the show, the real future Flash is very different in the comics. When Iris and Wally West get into a car accident, Wally ends up dying and Iris gets paralyzed. Blaming himself for not being there, Barry becomes a much darker hero after. He kills the Reverse Flash, Mirror Master, and Grodd before turning his attention on his past. The Speed Force has a tear in it, so Barry kills his younger self and uses the energy to seal that tear. Good Barry wakes up in a savage world, a place outside of time, and he uses his intelligence to return to the normal world and then fights off his future self once again. The two then team up against a different villain who wants to use the Speed Force to destroy the world, and the older Barry creates a large enough explosion to kill the villain, which was technically him himself, but basically the gist of this storyline is that Barry's mad at himself for not being able to save Wally and Iris, so he decides that the only way to fix this is to go back in time and kill his younger version, cause that makes sense. In at 8, Kid Flash. Wallace West, also known as Kid Flash in DC Rebirth, is the son of Daniel West, who becomes Reverse Flash, and the nephew of Iris West. Due to some time traveling events involving the Speed Force and, you know, the reasons that they had to make sure that the characters were the same age in the comics, Wally gains speed power similar to his idol the Flash, and becomes eager to fight crime. But he needs training because, you know, he, he's new to the speed force and having speed, and he's also kind of reckless. Although Wally doesn't really listen to Barry, he respects and listens to the Flash, who is Barry's alter ego, but he doesn't actually know about it. He doesn't know that Barry's the Flash at this point. But Barry knows about Wally's. Barry takes Wally under his wing as the Flash and trains him, but their relationship becomes strained when Barry is forced to reveal his identity. Wally already resented Barry for being distant with Iris, but when he discovers that Barry is the Flash, he hates him even more. He's furious at Barry for keeping the secret for so long, and it just it made the resentment grow that much more, so... Yeah. In its seven, Green Lantern. After Hal Jordan's descent into madness, Ganthit, the last guardian of the universe, created one final Green Lantern ring and bestowed it upon the artist Kyle Rayner. Entrusting him with the legacy of the Green Lantern Corps, despite some initial doubts, Kyle proved to be an exemplary Green Lantern and even rivaled the iconic greatness of Hal Jordan. When Kyle joined the Justice League, though, it was a significant moment for him, but one member of the team wasn't thrilled, and it was Wally West, who was known as the Flash. Both Wally and Kyle were legacy heroes and relatively new to their roles, but Wally initially disliked Kyle, believing him to be too inexperienced and lacking the ability to fill Hal's shoes. Similarly, Kyle couldn't stand Wally at first either. Despite their initial animosity towards each other though, they eventually learned to work together and became friends, with Wally even entrusting Kyle with protecting the Earth in his absence. Number 6, Eternals. The Eternals and Avengers both seem to have beef with each other when the two teams clashed in AXE, which 
for those who are unfamiliar, was the summer to winter event of 2022. Avengers versus X-Men versus Eternals, or AXE, or AXE. Judgment Day. Here, the X-Men were being attacked by the race known as the Eternals, who were now being led by the manipulative Druig. To combat this, some members of the Eternals team sought to bring back one of their gods, the Celestials, in the hopes that, you know, the Celestial would right all the chaos going on and basically punish Druig. They kidnapped Tony Stark and worked with him to resurrect a fallen Celestial, essentially breathing new life into it and creating kind of a kind of a new Celestial altogether. Iron Man agreed to help, but based the nervous system off his own. And ultimately, when the progenitor woke and came online, it gave the entire Earth 24 hours to prove that they were worthy of life. The Eternals and the X-Men then both kind of looked at Tony and, well, I mean, kind of blamed him for this in part. I mean, he did base it off of himself, so yikes. Number 5. Emma Frost Emma Frost definitely is more inclined to give the Avengers the cold shoulder from time to time. To her, they deserve it. Emma's posed question when it comes to the Avengers and their relationship to mutant kind and the X-Men is, what have you done for us lately? Despite her and Tony's Stark even having had an established on and off again romance between them, she has no qualms with also grilling him on why he and the Avengers team have never been around when mutants needed them most, like you know, during the tragedy in Genosha. Like many mutants, Emma is left wondering why the Avengers haven't used you know, the fact that they're loved and celebrated the world over to stand with mutants and actively attempt to lift them up in the public eye and help fight against everyone that hates them. Tony's response to Emma's line of questions is to point out that, you know, the Avengers have also had a hard time when it comes to their being accepted by the world. But Emma, she isn't buying it. And to be fair, mutant based heroes have traditionally had it, I think, a lot harder in comparison to human based heroes. So I think I stand with Emma on this one. Number four, Beast. Beast is having a wild time in his life right now in the comics. Oh, Hank, what happened to you? He is, in essence, Dark Beast. But you know, what if Dark Beast simply existed in the main continuity? Because we know Dark Beast is dead. So this can't be Dark Beast, sadly. We can't explain it away. Recently, Beast created his own council of beasts, and every time I see him do just about anything in the comments lately, I question if he is still sane and isn't somehow losing his mind. Beast is currently the head of X Force, which seems to have made him extremely paranoid against anything that isn't actively advertising itself as being very, very pro mutant, which is where the Avengers come in. They have never really been actively pro mutant, I would say, although at times they have worked to try and better understand their friends, the X Men, and have even stood with mutants and sometimes been an ally. They have also though done things to, in a roundabout way, kind of harm mutants. Or at least, you know, haven't always been there when mutant kind really could have used some help from the heroes. So whether or not they are on Beast's strike list, they are most likely a team that he would not care for. And honestly, even some of the folks Beast does seem to care for, or has cared for in the past at least, have seemingly popped up on his strike list of late. So just based on that, it's not looking good for the event standing with Hank. Number 3, Daredevil. Currently in the comics, Daredevil is the one with a target on his back when it comes to the hero the Avengers are currently going after. And get this, the reason they want to bring Daredevil to justice is because he's trying to reform villains. Like Wait, what? Apparently, we can chalk this feud up to a misunderstanding where so many hero versus hero conflicts obviously come from. The Avengers have simply assumed that Daredevil is looking to build up a villain army, as opposed to, you know, simply talking to him and seeing that Matt Murdock is, in fact, just trying to give villains a second chance. It's not a villain army, and it's actually trying to turn them into heroes, which you'd think the Avengers would kind of be all for, because it just helps everyone. If only they simply were willing to sit down and have a conversation instead of jumping to conclusions, but obviously they can't do that because comics. Number two, The Punisher. Frank Castle and the Avengers have had a rocky relationship throughout the years. And when you look at both their differing philosophies on heroism and their approaches to it, kind of makes sense. To the Avengers, Frank Castle tends to go too far. For The Punisher, there are many times when the Avengers simply don't go far enough. And it actually came to a point where the Avengers were hunting Frank and trying to capture him in Punisher Warzone. They even succeeded with Iron Man putting him in his own separate cell where he was kept a safe distance away 
away from all other prisoners at all times. Because Tony knew if Frank felt he had a chance, he would kill the criminals he was locked up with. Which, to be fair to Tony, he probably would. <laughs> Number 1. X-Men The X-Men hate the Avengers because while the Avengers also get a lot of flack sometimes for things, for the most part, they can't really relate when it comes to what it's like to deal with all the hate that the X-Men and mutant kind just get for, well, being themselves and existing. Overall, the world loves the Avengers, but overall, the world tends to hate or judge the X-Men just because they're mutants, even though the X-Men have saved the world like multiple times. The differences between the two and just how much the Avengers didn't really get what was going on for the X-Men was highlighted during the Avengers vs X-Men event, also known as AVX. Although at least out of that we got the Uncanny Avengers, which was a team that Captain America put together in the hopes of mending the relationship between the two teams. Which you know, kind of worked I think. Number 10. Spider-Man and the Human Torch In one of his earliest adventures, Spider-Man broke into the Baxter building in an attempt to impress the Fantastic Four in hopes of being invited to join the team. This led to a misunderstanding and a conflict between Spider-Man and the team. Although this encounter left both sides with a bad taste in their mouths, it was Peter and Johnny who had the most tension between them due to Johnny's need to be seen as tough and manly, and Peter being reminded of the popular kids who used to pick on him, like Flash Thompson. The Fantastic Four eventually came around to the webbed wall crawler, and Spidey and the Torch became close friends, even referring to each other as brothers. But a friendly rivalry remained between the two. This is perhaps best memorialized in Amazing Spider-Man number 657 when we got a glimpse of a camping trip taken by the Fantastic Four in Spider-Man. The two began an elaborate and ever escalating prank war, with some highlights being Human Torch heating up a bowl of water to try and get a sleeping Spider-Man to wet himself, Spider-Man covering the toilet paper with webbing, Johnny using sunscreen and his powers to write the words flame on on Spidey's back, and Peter creating a fake shark fin out of webbing to scare the Human Torch when he was swimming. The two put a pause to their prank war in order to team up to play an elaborate trick on the thing, so while the two heroes have nothing but love and respect for each other, their friendly rivalry seems to bring nothing but joy to each of them. Which is a nice change from all the other entries on this list who seem to genuinely hate each other. Do Andrew and I have a friendly rivalry or do we have a rivalry where we hate each other? I hate you! <laughs> I only have the utmost respect for Andrew, so we'll have to resolve this at another time. Also, a quick reminder, if you like this video, you should do the things that people do when they like stuff, like click like or subscribe. Number 9. Moonstone and Miss Marvel Speaking of rivalries where people hate each other, I also know a lot of people might not know who Moonstone is, and might say, Amanda, there are bigger rivalries than this one that you could be covering right now. And hey, I hear you. But while this list is about biggest rivalries, I also like to keep things fresh by touching on characters and relationships and lists like this that we don't often get to talk about. One, because it helps me to stay sane by not telling you about the same stuff on repeat because, you know, I've been here for a while, guys. And two, it's just fun to learn new things. I love learning new things and I hope you do too. So for those of you who don't know, Moonstone was a member of the Thunderbolts and is Carla Sofin. From day one, she was pretty much a straight up villain. Even when she was a psychiatrist before she got her powers, she was a pretty mean and awful psychiatrist, to be honest. At one point, she becomes the Dark Avengers version of Miss Marvel standing in for Carol Danvers, who refused to join up with Norman Osborn's team, understandably, and who at the time was known as Miss Marvel. This was before Carol took up the mantle of her former mentor, Marvel, and became Captain Marvel. As a result, the two ended up becoming adversaries. And after Carol dies and is resurrected, Carla fights her for the title of Miss Marvel. She kind of loses this fight, but in a weird twist, she also like finds herself again during it, becoming Moonstone once more, with Carol also becoming whole again as a result. Also, for those who are wondering, this is who Carol was fighting in the thumbnail slash the cover photo, if you would prefer, for our part one to this list, which you should definitely check out if you haven't done that already. I don't actually hate Amanda. I just hate that she's clearly more popular than me. <laughs> what? Number 8. North Star and Guardian I know, I know, I have an Alpha Flight problem, just deal with it. Compared to other Marvel teams like the Avengers or certainly the X-Men, Canada's super team, Alpha Flight, has been relatively free from interpersonal conflict. Part of this is because of how the team is divided up across the country and rarely actually have to team up with everyone, and partly because Canadians are so polite that rivalries are much harder to spot. However, two teammates who have never gotten along are Jean-Paul Bobier and James McDonald Hudson. Hudson thinks 
of Jean Paul as an arrogant, petulant jerk, and Jean Paul thinks of Hudson as a manipulative government stooge. Both characters have relatively valid points, and as someone who wants Quebec to be its own separate nation, it makes sense that North Star would have an issue with the guy dressed in the Canadian flag. But what is the source of this rivalry? Before the formation of Alpha Flight, North Star believed himself to be an only child. But when Hudson began searching Canada for potential members of his super team, he discovered both North Star and his long lost twin sister, Jean Marie. He introduced the two and made both of them members of Alpha Flight, giving them the opportunity to get to know each other while serving as team members. You'd think that would make North Star relatively grateful, but when they discovered that Jean Marie was actually mentally unstable, suffering from dissociative identity disorder, North Star wanted her removed from the team for her own well being. She refused to leave, and Hudson allowed her to stay, making North Star believe that Hudson was taking advantage of her poor mental health to keep a powerful team member around. The two have had a rocky relationship ever since, with North Star openly insulting Guardian in the field, and Guardian mostly brushing it off unless it begins to interfere with the mission. Despite their issues, they are capable of supporting each other from time to time, with North Star reluctantly attending James's funeral the first time he died, and James showing up in uniform to North Star's wedding in Astonishing X-Men number 51. I'm the Human Torch and you're Spider-Man, and you're mine. I can live with that. Oh my gosh. Also guys, show Andrew that he's also popular and, and give him love in the comments. Number seven, Madam Mask and Hawkeye. No, not, not that Hawkeye. This hot guy. Madam Mask has beef with a few heroes and some kind of weird romances too, but that's for another list. Like her relationship with Iron Man, which is a love affair, but then it can also be adversarial too, since, you know, she's a villain. Anyways, with Kate Bishop's Hawkeye, these two developed beef after Kate attempted to help out Clint Barton's Hawkeye while he was trying to retrieve a tape from a black market auction that showed him assassinating a dictator. Don't worry though, Clint didn't really do this. The tape was actually a fake to help protect the true identity of the agent who completed the mission on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s Black Ops team. Kate ended up impersonating Madam Mask at the auction wearing her mask and her clothes after incapacitating her, something Madam Mask would not easily forget and would actually swear revenge on her for, hence their rivalry. At least we can all agree that Adam's the worst of us, right? Like. Number 6. Hulk and the Red Hulk When Bruce Banner transformed into the Hulk in his first appearance, he stumbled across Betty Ross. The sight of the Hulk caused Betty to faint, and her father, Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross, vowed to destroy the monster. This has led to one of the longest rivalries in Marvel history, as Ross has used his position as a general to hunt Banner across the world, hoping to either capture or kill him. The fact that Banner managed to defeat other threats such as the Abomination led Ross to eventually develop a grudging respect for him, but the hate never really died down, not even once Bruce married Ross's daughter, making the man his son-in-law. They came to terms briefly, but once Betty was killed, the rivalry fired up again. The rivalry reached new heights when Ross teamed up with villains such as Modoc and the leader to transform himself into the Red Hulk. After years of stewing hatred, Ross was able to actively fight the Hulk and even defeat him in their first encounter. The Hulk of course eventually bounced back and took out Ross. Ross has bounced around with his allegiances, having been everything from a villain to an Avenger, but whatever side he is on, he never turns down an opportunity to make life difficult for Banner or the Hulk. Then Adam is the thing, and then we can both prank Adam together. Adam, if you're watching this video, watch watch out, but you're probably not, so haha, we're gonna get you! To number five. Flash and Eobard Thawne. Things are definitely real when you will travel through time to not only fight your rival, but then travel through time again to change their entire reality. What's really weird here is that Eobard Thawne was actually a huge fan of the Flash, but being from the future, and because time just be like that sometimes, he surprisingly learned that the Flash's greatest villain, Reverse Flash, was Eobard Thawne himself, and then he made sure that this came to pass, kind of like a, a weird manifest destiny thing. He got powers similar to the Flash, went back in time, and worked alongside Wally West pretending to be the Flash himself, Barry Allen. Thawne claims responsibility for taking down the Flash family. He destroyed Wally West's life, and probably the most pivotal Flash story, Flashpoint, involved Thawne and Barry battling through time, with Barry attempting to stop Thawne from taking the life of Nora Allen, Barry's mom. Which caused a whole different reality to form, and Thawne observed the whole thing, mocking Barry pretty much the whole time. Eobard Thawne found out he was supposed to be a villain, and so he decided he was going to go extremely hard with that, and be the most dastardly devil you ever did see. Number 4, Sinestro and Hal Jordan. Sinestro has a serious case of the jealousy. Throughout Sinestro was considered to be the absolute best of the best that the Green Lantern Corps had to offer, and he was proud of that fact. He even trained the unlikely Hal Jordan to become a Green Lantern, but 
Then, Hal went and became the greatest Green Lantern, and that inspired no kindness from little old Sinestro. Nuh uh uh. Sinestro hated Hal to a degree. There was also this whole thing of opposing morals. Sinestro held the point that fear and deadly force were the best ways to improve not only the world, but the universe. And Hal helped Sinestro's own planet turn against him. And then, Sinestro was kicked out of the Green Lantern Corps. Instead, he literally forged the Yellow Power Ring and created the Yellow Lantern Corps itself, aka the Sinestro Corps. They have had some pretty damn intense battles, and Sinestro was pretty instrumental in that whole little parallax thing that we've talked about before. Now I don't know about you guys, but Sinestro is also incredibly good at being a huge jerk to Hal, but all while being incredibly entertaining to read. Like I'm definitely a fan of Sinestro over Hal Jordan, and I'm not afraid to say that. Number 3, Shazam and Black Adam. If you think about it, the feud between these two magic powerhouses is probably the longest in the Earth's history. It goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, and the fun part here is that while Black Adam has done some truly horrible and villainous things, he's not really Really considered to be as much of a villain as some of the other villains who are on this list. He has still massacred an entire country for no reason, but yeah, definitely an anti-hero for sure. Black Adam fights for the oppressed and is a champion for his people, but he will use any means necessary to do that. When he became the champion of the wizard Shazam, Black Adam's methods caused the wizard to trap the champion in an amulet. Now it took centuries for the wizard to choose a new champion, and that was Billy Batson. This didn't happen though until a man would betray and end the lives of Billy's parents so that he could reawaken Black Adam. So now, the wizard's old violent champion and his new heroic one are on Earth at the same time, and Black Adam ain't too happy about that. Going to incredibly sadistic lengths to try and stop Billy, who is one of the few characters that can actually oppose and stop Black Adam at all. And he has on multiple occasions, just growing the hatred between the two of them. Coming in at number two, Superman and Lex Luthor. Let's be honest, with only two spots left on this list, most people knew what was coming here. While Brainiac is an incredibly great villain for Superman, challenging the Man of Steel with his intelligence more than even this incredibly intelligent Lex Luthor can, Lex has a burning, unsated hatred for Superman, vast amounts of wealth, and an understanding of people's base instincts that allow him to top pretty much everyone else in Superman's rogues gallery. What's interesting is that he didn't start that way. He didn't hate Superman so intensely at first, but after years and years and years of having his plans specifically thwarted by Superman himself, he really just became the number one thing that infuriated Lex beyond belief. The story, How Much Can One Man Hate, is actually a really good display of why Luther absolutely abhors Kal-El. The story showed that Luther's hatred for Superman was kind of born out of the praise and admiration that the Kryptonian received without ever needing to work really that hard for it. Of course, Lex orchestrated the events that took place in the Death of Superman story with Lex taking down his arch nemesis. Additionally, All-Star Superman saw their rivalry come to an end with Superman being taken off the board yet again by Lex Luthor's schemes. Lex himself is probably one of the best villains in comic book history, but I think a lot of us would have a hard time saying that when we know about the villain of the number one spot. And in number one, yeah, you probably guessed it, it's Batman and the Joker. These two are almost complete polar opposites. One stands for order, the other for chaos. One uses fear as a weapon against injustice, while the other turns laughter into the scariest thing you can possibly imagine. Batman is fueled by an idea, and the Joker has, well, basically no motivation at all, or, or that motivation changes depending on how he feels. Batman vows to preserve life while beating criminals to a pulp and leaving them in hospital beds, while the Joker almost always just leaves people without the ability to take another breath. This all started way back in 1951 when DC first introduced the Joker in The Man Behind the Red Hood. Before even becoming the clown prince of crime, this unnamed man was on the run from Batman and leapt into a vat of acid, creating the Joker in the first place. So, honestly, Batman himself kind of created the Joker, like indirectly. There are some truly pivotal epic stories in DC Comics that involve this rivalry. The Killing Joke, The White Knight, The Dark Knight Returns, Batman Endgame, A Death in the Family, Death of the Family, Joker's Five-Way Revenge, Three Jokers, Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on a Serious Earth, 
All of them are highly recommended and show this rivalry at its peak. All right, coming in at number 10 is Captain Marvel and Rogue. A lot of people may not even know about this one because I definitely did not until a couple of months ago. The mutant Rogue first started out as a villain in Marvel Comics. That part I did know. She was part of Mystique's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants and one of their first attacks on the Avengers involved ambushing a recently returned Carol Danvers. Rogue, who was still learning to use her abilities at the time, accidentally fully absorbed both Danvers' memories and her powers. The attack completely drained Carol of her powers and erased her mind. And then, just to add insult to injury, Rogue immediately decided to chuck Carol off the Golden Gate Bridge. Luckily, Spider-Woman was there and able to rescue her, and Professor Xavier was able to restore Carol's memories. But it wasn't complete. The actual emotional connection to those memories, as well as to her family and friends, was completely gone. Carol remembered things, but it was more like watching a show about her life instead of actually living it. Carol regained her powers eventually, but Carol's life was destroyed by a scared young woman who then had to deal with the consequences of her actions and the harm it caused to both of them. Number 9, Professor X and Magneto. These two are like the perfect definition of frenemies. While they have massive respect for each other and almost view each other as brothers, their ideologies are just in complete contrast and it has put them on opposite ends of the battlefield more often than not. Now, before you jump on me in the comments, I know Magneto is basically a hero now in recent years and the two of them became allies more than enemies. That's why they're all the way up here at number 9, but to deny the fact that they were one of the biggest rivalries in Marvel Comics it's just plain wrong. They basically fight for the same thing, the betterment of mutant kind. But while Xavier believes they should try to work with humans, Magneto believes mutants to be the future of the world and the dominant species. They are both right and they are both wrong. And they both have huge respect and love for one another. It's such a great dynamic. If you're enjoying this list so far, be sure to drop a like to let us know that this is the kind of content you want to see. Number eight, Venom and Carnage. Now I don't know about you guys, but the motivations for symbiotes seem to be very simple. Obviously, their motivations are fueled by their hosts, but without the host, a symbiote seems to just be a very primal being. So, when Venom's offspring bonded with a complete psychopath in Cletus Cassidy, the desire to end lives and cause destruction seemed to be almost double for them both. But for Venom and Eddie Brock, while they started out as straight up villains, Eddie and the other hosts have instilled this sort of odd desire to do good in Venom in his own weird way. Venom can be bad, but he is good enough to know that Carnage is really bad. And Venom would even put aside his hatred for Spider-Man to fight Carnage alongside the Web Slinger the first time they ever came to blows. And that's a pretty serious thing for Venom. Carnage has been Venom's number one enemy ever since. Number 7, Daredevil and Bullseye. I've said before that I think Bullseye is one of the more ruthless villains in Marvel Comics. He's just not a nice guy, and the evidence for that statement can be found in his history with Daredevil. While the Kingpin, Wilson Fisk, could also stand as Daredevil's biggest rival, it was never personal between the two of them. But for Bullseye, their rivalry became more and more personal, especially in Daredevil number 161, when we learned that Bullseye had become completely obsessed with his defeats to Daredevil, even hurting others like Black Widow just to get at Matt Murdock. But then, he just lost it when the Man Without Fear defeated him yet again. He now started to see strangers on the street as Daredevil and would send them to the afterlife. He's absolutely nuts, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say the rivalry became more personal for Daredevil as well, especially after two separate occasions where Bullseye had ended the lives of Matt Murdock's biggest love interests in Elektra and Karen Page. Number 6, Sentry and the Void. Let's try a different approach to this. What about a character whose own rival is himself? Or an aspect of himself? Honestly, with the sheer level of power possessed by the Sentry, it almost makes sense for his main rival to be his darkest aspect, the Void. When Robert Reynolds injected himself with an experimental Golden Sentry Serum, an offshoot and supposed improvement of the Super Soldier Serum, he gained the power of a million exploding suns and became one of the world's greatest superheroes. Until the Void arrived. The Void nearly took out Sentry's sidekick, Scout. It drove the Hulk into a rampage and took the lives of over one 
million people in Manhattan. When Reynolds realized this was his own dark persona, he enlisted Doctor Strange and Reed Richards and together they wiped the memory of Sentry from everyone in the world, including themselves. Let me know a character who you think could be a better rival for the Sentry, other than the Hulk. Down below. Number five, Storm and Emma Frost. A lot of people obsess over the rivalry over Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, that exists between Jean Grey and Emma Frost in the comics. But this rivalry between Emma and Aurora runs honestly even deeper. It comes from a time when Emma was still a villain, the white queen of the Hellfire Club, and ended up body swapping with Storm. Needless to say, Storm was not very happy with the white queen and held a grudge against her for years thereafter, the whole body swap incident. Body swapping is so creepy in stories, like, that is a total violation of someone's privacy in like a whole other way. Talk about evil. I mean, I guess unless you are like consensually swapping bodies with someone, then it's just kind of weird with the potential I suppose to even be cool. Even in the Jean Grey and Emma Frost giant size comic that came out only a few years ago, it was shown that Storm still thinks of Emma as her rival, even though they are both now technically allies and both sit on Krokoa's quiet council. Number four, Daredevil and the Punisher. When it comes to the good guys of the Marvel Universe, there's somewhat of a spectrum of morality, with most of them falling somewhere in the middle. While a lot of characters like, say, Iron Man aren't kill crazy, they also aren't above taking the lives of their enemies if it comes down to it. On opposite ends of the spectrum, you have Daredevil and the Punisher. While Daredevil is strictly against murder and will avoid it at all costs, only resorting to it when under mind control or when he has literally no other choice, like when he killed the helicopter pilot who was using a minigun to turn Hell's Kitchen into a war zone and killing several people a minute in Daredevil number 233. On the other end of the spectrum is Frank Castle, otherwise known as the Punisher, who goes out of his way to murder as many criminals as possible. Possible, believing that people are incapable of changing. This different of methodology, of course, has caused the two to come to blows several times over the years, as Daredevil tries to stop crimes and put criminals away with the legal system, while Frank has no faith in the system and usually tries to kill every criminal he comes across. The two are known to try and convince one another that their way is better, sometimes in very extreme ways, such as in Punisher Volume 5, Number 3, where Frank chained Daredevil to a roof with a gun taped to his hand, telling him that he must shoot him in order to prevent him from killing a criminal. This rivalry has spawned some of the best best moments in each of the characters history as well as a mini series called Daredevil vs Punisher which is of course completely devoted to this rivalry. Number 3, She-Hulk and Titania. She-Hulk and Titania have a very interesting relationship in the comics and while they may be on more friendly terms now in regards to Titania moving away from being a true criminal as so many so many Marvel villains have done in recent years, these two ladies are still rivals. In fact, they even came together to kind of celebrate the love of their rivalry in a friendly manner by creating in essence a fight club for others to get together and blow off steam. Although initially Jen did suggest that it's just kind of a fight club between them two exclusively. Titania and She-Hulk make for excellent rivals because they are both fierce, determined characters who are well known for their strength and indomitability. In fact, they have a lot in common. And when they fight one another because they are both so tough, neither has to really worry about actually hurting the other as they are fairly evenly matched. Also, you know their rivalry is iconic when it's used as the opener for a She-Hulk series, which it was recently in the 2022 She-Hulk comic by Rainbow Rowell. And if you aren't reading this comic, by the way, you need to be, trust me. Number two. The Thing and the Hulk. Although many would say that the Hulk is the strongest one there is, Ben Grimm might disagree. These two super strong heroes have gone toe to toe several times over the years, starting their conflict over 60 years ago in Fantastic Four number 25. Their fights are always an event fans look forward to, with no clear and consistent winner ever really being named. In their first conflict, Ben was able to come out on top, likely because of his ability to keep a cool, clear head throughout the fight. In their next fight, in Incredible Hulk number 122, Hulk had to fight the entire Fantastic Four, but managed to hold his own before eventually being taken down. Their next one-on-one -on -one bout in Fantastic Four, number 112, ended with the Hulk landing a devastating and almost lethal right hook on the Thing, giving him his first victory. They fought again in Fantastic Four, number 167, but Ben began transforming back into his human form, giving Hulk a massive advantage. Their next fight in Fantastic Four, 320, ended in a victory for the Thing, but Hulk was in his Grey Hulk form, thereby being half as strong as his usual green self. Grey Hulk had a rematch with the Thing in Incredible Hulk 350, which went more his way. They've had a couple more bouts since then, with the Hulk usually coming out on top, but despite this, the two have become friends, bonding over their experience as normal men transformed into something more. In issue 49 of The Immortal Hulk, we got to see how despite everything, Ben will prioritize their friendship over their conflict when he took the time to comfort a Hulk who had just been attacked by the Avengers and make sure that he was okay before helping the Green Goliath in his quest to defeat the one below all and the leader. Despite this, it is likely 
only a matter of time before we see these two come to blows once again in the Marvel Universe. Number 1. Wolverine and Cyclops It's a rivalry as old as time. Well, not, not as old as time actually, but as old as Wolverine's first appearance almost. Wolverine and Cyclops have been known to butt heads almost since Wolverine first joined the team. Shortly after Wolverine joined up with the X-Men, Cyclops seemed to struggle with Wolverine's more aggressive nature, causing conflict between the two. And soon after joining, Wolverine developed feelings for Jean Grey, aka Marvel Girl, Scott's girlfriend, which also complicated the two superheroes' relationship and feelings towards one another. While they have always been rivals though, Scott and Logan are also like brothers. They've been through hell together as fellow X-Men, and while they may not always agree, they definitely also are more often willing to work together to help innocents and their fellow mutants. And that is a matter they do at least always agree on, that of helping those who need it. At the end of the day, they're both superheroes, and while they may fight from time to time, they will inevitably end up working back together as teammates, friends, and basically mutant brothers. Number 10. Batman and Green Lantern Guy isn't the only person who has a problem with Batman, and vice versa. Many Green Lanterns seem to rub the Dark Knight the wrong way. I think it's because he doesn't trust the amount of power they are given, and perhaps the process in which, you know, they're chosen. Batman has also been shown to have disagreements with Hal Jordan's Green Lantern in the past, and demonstrate a lack of trust in him, despite his accolades. Although, I guess with Hal's track record, that's kind of fair. In the world of Frank Miller's all-star Batman and Robin, Batman even straight up attacks Hal when he criticizes Batman, exploiting his, at the time, weakness to the color yellow. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love big superhero rivalries, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 9. Deadpool and Wolverine Another classic feud is one between Deadpool and Wolverine. I love this one. This pretty much has to do with Wolverine being one of the most like serious guys around, and Wade being pretty much a complete goof all the time, who sometimes also just happens to be not very good at what he does. Whereas, by contrast, you know, Wolverine is very good at what he does. Although, what both of these two anti-hero-ish characters often do isn't very nice. Deadpool and Wolverine have been forced to team up on a few occasions, and it's always fun to watch them do so because, you know, they're both so different. And yet in some ways, they're also kind of similar, even though I feel like Wolverine would not admit that. Last time I saw them team up in the comics was in X-Force, where Deadpool ended up mainly acting as comic relief, despite his intentions to prove himself to the rest of the team and prove that he deserved his place among them. Number 8. Human Torch and the Thing Talk about some brotherly love and also some brotherly chaos. This is exactly what Human Torch, aka Johnny Storm, and the Thing, aka Ben Grimm of the Fantastic Fantastic Four have going on. These two love to fight and compete with one another, and pull pranks whenever they can get away with it. But at the end of the day, their rivalry is really all fun and laughs. For the most part, it seems they enjoy pushing one another's buttons because they know each other so well and love each other so much. And obviously, if you know someone really well and you love them really well, you're probably pretty good at pushing their buttons when you want to. It's maybe the cutest and most earnest kind of sibling superhero rivalry on this list, despite the fact that yes, Johnny and Ben aren't blood-related siblings. Being part of the Fantastic Four though does mean being part of a family. Number 7. Spider-Man and Wolverine Spider-Man and Wolverine have an even deeper rivalry, probably because they have even less in common it would seem on the outside than even the bizarre duo of Logan and Wade. Logan and Wade actually at least have some shared experience in acting as mercenaries and both having their heads scrambled by people, and they've both been known to behave like anti-heroes, whereas Spider-Man and Wolverine are almost kind of on like two opposite sides when it comes to their approach to heroic. The one thing they seem to share though I will say is that their heart is definitely both in the right place. But just like Daredevil and Punisher, and even more so perhaps, these two struggle to see eye to eye when it comes to their approach and ideology in regards to how best to be a superhero and their heroic tactics. Number 6. Hulk and Bruce Banner These two were really at odds recently in Don and Kate's Hulk series, and their history has been a tumultuous one, with sometimes the Hulk or Bruce being painted as the villain and the other being painted as the hero. However, in reality, both Bruce Banner and the Hulk have acted as heroes before, and also acted as villains, and they've also even worked together before. In Immortal Hulk, they seem to find some sense of balance and harmony, but this didn't end up lasting too long, as Bruce then turns on the Hulk personas within himself, imprisoning the Hulk to use him as an engine for his space adventures. Odds are good, no matter how many times these two end up making peace with one another, that they will eventually always return to butting heads at some point. 
Okay, number five, Wolverine and Sabretooth. Where Xavier and Magneto are frenemies, these two are essentially mortal enemies and they take it to an insanely violent level. Honestly, I feel like a lot of this is just because of Sabretooth. Like, Logan seems like he just wants to live a peaceful life and Sabretooth just comes out of nowhere, multiple times, to ruin that. It's almost frustrating, but they wouldn't be the same if their rivalry did not exist. They actually started out as friends in the beginning. And then, on orders from another bad guy, Sabretooth brought Logan's girlfriend to an end on Logan's birthday. Then, ever since, this became a tradition as every single year on Logan's birthday, Victor would hunt him down and fight Logan until he was basically at the pearly gates, just to prove he was better. And these guys have lived for hundreds of years, so imagine that every year on your birthday. That would suck. Number four, Thor and Loki. Thanks to the MCU making Loki so damn likable, this rivalry became a bit more suppressed in recent years, but this rivalry goes back before pretty much anything else. These guys are literally gods and have been around for essentially thousands of years. It all began with childhood pranks as Thor was exceedingly proud and Loki is the trickster god. But Loki's schemes would become more and more intense and endangering as they grew up. Loki trying to bring Thor into trouble and battle by manipulating the Hulk is the whole reason Thor joined up with the Avengers and the team was formed in the first place. There is also the fact that Loki would be the cause of Ragnarok, the fated apocalyptic event that brings the end of Asgard. You can't really find a rivalry that's outlasted this one as it is quite literally myth and legend. Number three, Reed Richards and Doctor Doom. Nothing like a good old college rivalry to keep you sharp and on your toes. If Victor Von Doom and Reed Richards, two of the smartest men in Marvel Comics had teamed up together or tried to encourage one another, the world would probably be a utopia. Unfortunately, Doctor Doom is one arrogant guy and he is much more theoretical, famous for using magic and mysticism alongside his genius, whereas Reed is incredibly practical. Reed also seems to not respect boundaries, as in college he read his rival's research on trying to save his own mother and then proceeded to tell Doom all the ways it wouldn't work. Doom's arrogance led him to dismiss Reed and then it turned out Reed was right, which led directly to the scarring of Doom's face. This was before they had even become their super selves. Their rivalry comes almost entirely down to the fact that Doom will never admit that Reed is smarter than him. Doom is petty, but we love him for it. Number two, Captain America and Red Skull. What's interesting about this one is that there probably wouldn't even be a Captain America without the Red Skull's existence. If it weren't for Johann Schmidt's activities on the Axis side of power during Marvel's World War II, then the plan for a super soldier serum to combat him may not have even appeared. Stopping the Red Skull was one of Steve Rogers' first assignments, and his whole Captain America persona was created in stark contrast to the Red Skull, who had become an icon for his side of the war. As such, the rivalry between these two characters is one of the longest running ones in Marvel's history, other than Thor and Loki. Even after Captain America was frozen on ice for decades and came back to the world, Skull found a way to follow him. The Skull even finds ways to come back from the afterlife just to keep on fighting Captain America. And in at number one, Peter Parker and the Green Goblin. The answer to who Spider-Man's main rival is isn't really clear cut as someone like Captain America or Thor. It's usually a bit of a tie between Dr. Otto Octavius and Norman Osborn. But if we are being honest with each other here, the personal connections and personal attacks that belong to Green Goblin have absolutely made a bigger splash in Peter's life, both personally and as a hero. Gobby orchestrated the Clone Saga, one of the most infamous Spider-Man stories that saw the hero completely doubt who he was. And he did it all from the shadows after taking the life of Gwen Stacy and coming back from his own demise. He returned from the afterlife and his main goal was to still mess with Spider-Man. Doc Ock has succeeded in actually defeating Spider-Man, but Norman makes his life as miserable as he can because he can strike at Peter personally. Today, Norman has made a change to become a hero as the Gold Goblin, but in the very first issue, you get the vibe that that won't actually last. Coming in at number 10 is Daredevil and the Punisher. These two crime-fighting street-level heroes have been butting heads for a hot minute. As with a lot of pairings on this list, to say that they absolutely despise each other is kind of pushing it. Matt Murdock and Frank Castle respect one another, even if their philosophies to crime fighting are in direct contradiction to one another. Matt is a pretty devout Catholic. He's a lawyer. He believes in the criminal justice system and he's got a pretty strict no life taking policy, except for maybe like three 
instances that are pretty easy to justify. And then there's Frank. The criminal justice system not working is the very reason his family were taken from him. He believes the system to be broken and that his method of an eye for an eye, if you're a criminal you don't deserve to live, is ingrained into the whole philosophy of his hero activities. They couldn't be more different in terms of their morals, but running in the same circle and working in such close proximity to one another means that they are almost forced to work together. And because of that, they have eventually learned how to work together, even begrudgingly. And even though one thinks this horned crime fighter is naive, and the other thinks his skull themed colleague is a pervasion of the system he fights for, they still find a way to make it work. Number 9 Green Arrow and Hawkman The interesting thing about this somewhat surprising rivalry between two sometimes forgotten Justice League members, no offense to either, is that it's political. Other rivalries in comics are predominantly centered around modus operandi or love interests or personality differences, but this is just straight up that Green Arrow is pretty liberal and Hawkman, being either a centuries old reincarnated warrior prince or a space cop and sometimes both, is pretty damn conservative. The debates between these two heroes are pretty intense and they've both been wrong and right in different instances, which makes for very interesting storytelling and dynamics. Oliver Queen has been paired up with a space cop before, talking Hal Jordan Green Lantern, and while they butted heads from time to time during their travels together, Arrow's vocalization of his political views never seemed to bother the Lantern as much as it bothers Hawkman. Green Arrow is the kind of guy to demand Aquaman opens Atlantis to democratic elections, and Hawkman has been dubbed the ultimate conservative. They just do not work. Number 8 Batman and Guy Gardner I'm gonna be honest here, I think most of us are on Batman's side with this one. Batman has never really gotten along with Green Lanterns. I can't really tell you why because I don't know enough, so if you do know, share with us in the comments. But what I do know is that of all the Green Lanterns, Guy Gardner is known to be just the most unlikable. He's boisterous, cocky, a big old meathead, and he's got a stupid haircut. At first, Batman and Guy's rivalry was a bit of a joke, but then it pretty quickly changed to the point that only one hero was left as a joke. In 1987, we were given the Justice League International that had an awesome team of heroes including Shazam, Black Canary, Doctor Fate, Blue Beetle, Martian Manhunter, among others, with Batman as their appointed leader. Most people would agree that Batman is a more than qualified leader for a team like this, but one person who didn't take too kindly to Batman's leadership position and even wanted the role for himself was Mr. Gardner. After going on a big old rant and Batman calling Gardner a mongrel, the Lantern takes off his ring and decides to challenge the Dark Knight to a battle of fist the cuffs. One punch later and the lantern became the biggest laughing stock of the superhero community. Even Superman finds it funny. Number 7 Spider-Man and Wolverine Spider-Man and Wolverine doesn't really seem like a matchup you'd ever really expect. The funny thing is, they actually really work well together. Most of the time. It's really funny to see these two work together because you've got one of the most quippy, lighthearted, inspiring, and morally positive heroes teamed up with one of the most grumpy, rageful, animalistic, and brutal heroes in the Marvel landscape. The thing here is that while these two may clash, they're almost like brothers. Think like Wolverine as Big Brother and Spider-Man as Little Brother. Spider-Man and his snarky ways has a knack for getting under the skin of Wolverine's short temper. But I mean, we've also got instances of Wolverine hitting on Mary Jane, Spider-Man throwing Wolverine out of an Avengers tower window, and Wolverine being a little too stabby stabby with his claws for Peter Parker's no killing preferences. So they have definitely clashed and butted heads. And oh my god, there is also the Ultimate Universe versions of the characters who swapped bodies Bodies, with Wolverine being the most creepy creep ever to Peter's girlfriend. But for the most part, when these two heroes show up together, it's a treat. Number 6 Cable and Deadpool Similar to Wolverine and Spider-Man, most of the times when Deadpool and Cable team up together, it makes for an entertaining read. Almost for the same reasons as Wolverine and Spider-Man too, honestly. One smarmy guy who talks a lot and one grizzled guy who talks very little always fun. But unlike those two, Deadpool was literally introduced as a villain specifically 
for Cable. In New Mutants number 98, Deadpool was hired by Tolliver to bring Cable down. The failure of this task put Deadpool on the warpath to try his darndest to bring this incredibly popular 90s hero down. They clashed multiple times with Deadpool being one of Cable's constantly returning villains. As most people know, the hatred between these two characters didn't last forever, specifically ending when their respective series were cancelled and we were given Cable and Deadpool if looks could kill. Wade gets contracted by the One World Church to steal the Facade Virus, a new disease that turns everyone blue in order to achieve global equality with the side effect of people melting. Cable is also fully aware of the virus and has the goal of destroying it, which puts the two heroes head to head. Deadpool eventually gets the upper hand on Cable and gives it to the church, who turn around and infect both he and Cable with the virus just to test it out. Luckily, using his powers, Cable absorbs Deadpool into him, their genetic structure temporarily bonding, he vomits up Wade's essence, which heals back into his old body. Cable then uses his ship's teleportation matrix, which takes Deadpool along for the ride and they appear in the same location, graphically bonded together before tearing themselves free of one another. The anti-heroes learn that due to being bonded genetically, Cable's machines recognize them as the same entity. So whenever either of them teleports, the other is along for the ride. So basically, the two are almost forced to eventually get along with each other and have a pretty cool, pretty cool relationship. They're kind of cool. Number 5. Miss Marvel and Rogue Back when Miss Marvel was none other than Carol Danvers, of course. These two women had a long standing rivalry because of how much Rogue really messed Carol up. Rogue not only stole Carol's powers, but also left her comatose and, upon recovery without much of her memories and emotional connections to her memories. At the same time, this wasn't exactly a walk in the park for Rogue either, who also didn't much care for Carol as Carol's own memories and psyche basically haunted Rogue as a result of their altercation. For a while, these two really did not like and even hated each other. The good news is, Carol. Carol would actually have nothing to fear from Rogue now, as Rogue has much better control over her powers and doesn't really need to worry much anymore about accidentally draining someone's memories, life force energy, or even accidentally their powers. Number 4. Wolverine and Cyclops Even more iconic than any other superhero rivalry involving Wolverine is probably the one between him and Cyclops. Now, you could chalk this one up to the fact that Logan is just hot tempered at times and stubborn, and therefore he just, you know, doesn't often get along well with others. But really, when it comes to these two, it's actually all about the approach to heroism and breaking rules versus playing by them. Which oddly enough doesn't always mean that each person is always advocating for the same principle between those two, but they generally tend to be on opposite sides regardless. For example, if Wolverine is arguing that breaking the rules is the right play, then Slim is usually arguing against that and, you know, vice versa. At the same time, their rivalry is also quite brotherly at times, and at the end of the day, probably a lot not like Cap and Iron Man, these two men respect one another and despite their infighting, often would consider the other a part of their family. Number 3. Batman and Superman These two are often thought of as being the best of friends, and well, I mean they are. But that doesn't mean that they don't have fights and that they don't have any beef with each other at any point. In fact, in some realities, the differences between them lead the two to become sworn enemies, as opposed to staying the best of friends. The best thing about these two heroes is in fact how different they both are to one another, and perhaps what has made their rivalry and friendship so strong throughout the years and throughout DC's multiverse is that they both see how much they are different from the other. In some cases, they deeply respect and admire the other's differences, in other cases, it actually leads them to try and break their once fellow colleague, unable to reconcile and accept the other's differences or mindset. Number 2. Iron Man and Captain America this one feels like a feud as old as time, it's at least as old as these characters are. And in fact, while it does have a long history, it's still relevant today. Captain America and Iron Man clashed during the first civil war, most iconically, but even recently have been seen at odds with one another following the events of AXC Judgment Day. While Captain America was deemed unworthy by the progenitor, Iron Man's Tony Stark was given a thumbs up instead, leaving the pair to bicker over the judgments and what they truly meant, if anything, during Judgment Day issue number 6. Tony asked Cap after the event, are you okay? With Cap responding, no, and we shouldn't feel okay. It was a wake up call. We should all pay attention and act. Tony clarifies, no, I don't mean that. I meant me passing and you failing. That must be hard for you. Steve pointedly responds by saying, you made the celestial. It was based on you and it tried to kill the earth and you're taking its opinion as meaning anything? Once again and always, opposite sides. 
Number 1. Black Panther and Namor While Iron Man and Captain America may have a more iconic feud in the comics and films, Black Panther and Namor have one that not only is between them, but also extends to their nation. And theirs has actually resulted in all out war, not just in the superhero community, but in terms of their own countries as well. This feud actually started as most do in comics as a misunderstanding. But as a result of that, both of their peoples began to mistakenly attack one another and Black Panther and Namor basically started to like watch out for the other person. Eventually, it got to the point that they can no longer let bygones be bygones and talk it out. In the film Wakanda Forever, we see this feud making its way to the big screen, with tensions rising between Shuri's Black Panther and Namor of the Talokan, as well as, you know, Wakanda and the Talokan. I feel like overall superhero rivalries are something that can be easily leveraged by villains to distract superheroes enough to give them the freedom they need to unleash their devious plots on the world. Number 10. Johnny Storm and the Thing For almost no reason whatsoever, these two have had a rivalry on and off in the comics. Why? No one really knows. Their fighting and arguing comes in the form of trading insults, with Grimm often threatening to kill Johnny. Jeez. The two prank each other and Johnny berates Grimm calling him ugly, while Grimm calls Johnny stupid. The two have quite the rivalry. Granted, this most likely comes from a loving place where they consider one another to be like brothers. But the strangest part is that despite all their fighting and bickering, they seem to have almost no fights between them when Johnny starts dating Grimm's ex, Alicia, while he is away. Strange feud indeed. Number 9. Wolverine and Cyclops You may be thinking, but everyone understands this rivalry. Wolverine and Cyclops are just polar opposites. No wonder they fight so much. Sure, this is true, but it's not usually their differences that bring the duo to blows. It's their similarities. Namely, that they are often both in love with the same woman. While their love for Jean Grey is as old as time, they even at one point fought over Emma Frost, which seems like it's a bit much. It seems like these two honestly just want to fight each other no matter what. Is it possible that they are not even jealous of the affections of the woman they're fighting over, but the affection that the woman receives from the other? Two dudes fighting as much as Summers and Logan makes you really want to know why. And if there is some tension to ship between them, I know I certainly would ship it. It's gotta be some love under all that hate. Number 8. Kitty Pride and Emma Frost For a team and family of mutants, the members of the X-Men sure fight a lot. Though Emma Frost was admittedly part of Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants, and longtime enemy to the X-Men, so it is understandable of Kitty Pride to be hesitant to trust her. But after Emma reformed, she didn't want to continue to not get along with Kitty. She actually was the first to extend the olive branch, offering Kitty a place at her school. Kitty, however, was still holding a grudge and refused. This led to Emma waging all out war on Shadowcat, which seems kind of intense. I get that the two already had a hard time getting along, but someone not wanting to sign up for your school does not mean that you should all out aim to like destroy them. Little overkill there, Emma. Number 7. Batman and the Green Lanterns This is a long standing rivalry that kind of makes sense when you consider Batman had to put up with the antics of Guy Gardner trying to steal command of the Justice League from him, and Hal Jordan, you know, mooning him and all sorts of antics. But Batman's rivalry with the Green Lanterns superseded even just these two jerks. Batman even has a beef with Jon Stewart, one of my favorite Green Lanterns. Why? Jon Stewart comes at him for all the Green Lantern hate he spews, calling him out as a man who is just threatened by Hal Jordan because Hal isn't afraid of him. Rather than admit that not seeing eye to eye with Hal is maybe a two way street, Batman just doubles down. He really does not like Green Lanterns telling him how it is. I mean, I get it in terms of Hal and Guy's case, but John? Really? You're gonna let a feud form there too just cause of the other Green Lanterns? Ugh, yipes. Why can't Batman just get along with at least one Green Lantern? Just one. Number 6. Wally West and Kyle Rayner These two heroes are both ones that adopted mantles. Wally West became the Flash after Barry Allen and Kyle Rayner replaced Hal Jordan's Green Lantern. The pair consistently mock one another and often try to debase each other, criticizing one another left, right and center. This feud started as soon as the two pretty much met, and stems from the fact that they simply think the other is just not good enough to replace the former hero who wore the costume previously. Which is interesting because almost everyone else thinks that they both do a good job. Rather than just accept that they are both doing their best and both good in different ways, they choose to bicker and compete at every opportunity they get. 
Like little kids, these two. Number five, Zatanna and Catwoman. Oh boy, does Catwoman have reason to have beef with Zatanna? These two ended up in a fight with one another after it was revealed that Catwoman may have only become a full fledged hero as a result of Zatanna manipulating her mind. Because of this revelation, Catwoman turned on Zatanna, with the two getting into a physical fight. In the end, Selena was rightly pissed at Z after learning this, feeling like she had never in her life been more violated than she was when Zatanna changed her against her will. It also made Catwoman question whether or not she was actually the hero she had become at this point, since she'd obviously had no choice in that matter. What a terrible thing to do to someone. Number 4, Jean Grey and Emma Frost. A feud that feels as old as time, really, or at least almost as old as Emma Frost's character. Initially, this feud started because Emma was a villain in the comics, being the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. This made her a rival to not just Jean, but also all of the X-Men. Emma was actually introduced around the time of the Dark Phoenix Saga too, and was one of those present and involved when Mastermind took Jean and brainwashed her into joining the Hellfire Club as its Black Queen. Of course, this wasn't really Jean, but the Phoenix, who had taken on Jean's likeness, both in personality and in appearance. What really caused these two women to dislike one another though took place when Emma had reformed and become a hero. And that happened mainly as a result of Emma having a psychic affair with Jean's husband, Scott Summers, aka Cyclops, during a time when their marriage was strained. Hence the feud. Number 3, Superman and Shazam. One of the most iconic feuds in comics isn't necessarily a real narrative feud. I mean, these two don't typically go after one another to fight needlessly in terms of themselves as characters. They don't really have much of a reason to be jealous of the other or even dislike the other, but they do end up pitted against each other, often in alternate realities, and just because people like to see who would win if they got in a fight. And actually, their feud extends back in history to like the creation of these characters, which were considered rivals in terms of them being with two different publishers at the time in comics. In most cases, because these two are so evenly matched, Generally, their fights end in either a standstill, a stalemate, or with Superman implied as the victor. While Superman might be weak to Shazam's magic, Shazam is often forced to transform back into Billy by Superman's tactics. So, number two, X Men and the Eternals. Though not all X Men and not all Eternals are involved in this one. This feud is actually what sets up the Avengers vs. X Men vs. Eternals Judgment Day event. It all goes down because of the reveal to the world that mutants have the power to resurrect themselves, which is happening now in modern comics. Essentially meaning that mutants have become immortal beings. Druig, who at the time is Prime Eternal, thinks this makes mutants far too powerful and labels them as deviants, which obviously deviants are the people that the Eternals must always fight against. Which apparently isn't that much of a stretch either, because genetic wise, mutants are similar enough to deviants for the deviants to successfully be able to use the gates on Krakoa. Labeling them as deviants means the Eternals go to war with the mutants and of course their premier superhero team, the X Men. Hence, X-Men and Eternals fighting each other. Number 1, Green Lantern and Batman. At this point, Batman pretty much has beef with them, um, well, almost any Green Lantern you can think of. At least most of the Green Lanterns who are Earth-based, I would say. The most famous feud between Batman and Green Lantern though is the one between Bruce and Guy Gardner. Guy Gardner is basically the epitome of everything that kind of irks Batman in regards to a fellow hero's attitude. He's brash, bold, grating, and often seen as undisciplined. At least, you know, in comparison to someone as regimented as Batman, I would say. When Guy Guy found himself in the Justice League and under Batman's leadership, the two clashed to the point that Guy actually decided to challenge Batman, hoping to replace the Dark Knight as the new leader of the team. Well, this didn't end very well for Guy, who was knocked out famously in one punch by Batman. Although it should be noted that this was Guy fighting without the power of the Green Lantern as he egotistically chose to take off his power ring and not fight with it, so yeah. Which is pretty Guy Gardner, I gotta say. Number 10, Hulk and Thor. Hulk and Thor recently clashed in Donny Cates' crossover story between their two series, both of which he is currently penning. The story that he wrote with them duking it out is entitled Banner War. However, these two also have a long history of having beef in the comics, albeit pretty playful beef I'd say. Their feud is similar in nature to that of Hulk's feud with the Thing. The question starting it all being who is really strongest between them. Thor likewise enjoys the challenge of taking on Hulk and the two are seen as being pretty evenly matched. Though at the end of the day, I would actually still say that Hulk is stronger, as Hulk is known for being 
the strongest there is after all. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us that you love us by clicking that like button. Number 9, Martian Manhunter and Green Lantern. Martian Manhunter was there when Jon Stewart's Green Lantern let an entire planet be destroyed as a result of his ego. The two were deployed to the planet in the hopes of saving it, but Green Lantern didn't feel that he actually needed Martian Manhunter's help and restrained him. Unfortunately, this proved to be a mistake, as when John found the bomb on the planet, it and the room that it was contained in was painted entirely yellow, preventing John from using his Green Lantern powers to do anything to destroy or defuse it. Yikes. As a result, the planet was destroyed, with only John and John surviving the explosion, leaving Martian Manhunter grossly disappointed in his colleague Green Lantern and his hubris. Number 8, Captain Marvel and Iron Man. This is a pretty ridiculous one considering how close these two were, but hey, Civil War 2 happened. It happened and we gotta acknowledge it. We can't ignore that. Carol and Tony used to be the best of friends, with Tony even using the nickname of Care Bear for Carol, a nickname that her BFF Jessica Drew, aka Spider Woman, also often uses, so you know that means that they're pretty close. However, this didn't stop them from getting into it when Carol believed the best way to deal with crime was by fighting criminals before they even manifested as such. That was what Civil War 2 was basically all about. Basically, it was Minority Report. Captain Marvel believed that using the inhuman Ulysses visions to prevent crime was the best course of action, whereas Tony, oddly enough the voice of reason here, believed the best way to go about things was actually to wait until an actual crime happened, not trust in, as he saw it, unreliable visions. Enter Civil War 2, which ended with Carol as pretty much a straight up unreasonable villain in the eyes of readers who punched Tony into a coma. Number 7, Robin and Robin. When it comes to the Bat family, there are quite a few feuds to be had, unsurprisingly. I mean, hey, it's a big family. Still, I think one of the most dramatic was the one between Tim Drake and Damian Wayne. Initially, when these two met, they seemingly got off on the wrong foot, and Tim kind of wanted to try to offer an olive branch. This came in the form of offering to spar with young Damian, with Tim promising to take it easy on him. However, everything quickly went awry when Damian revealed that earlier in the night he'd actually killed a criminal, the spook, taking his head. The two ended up fighting, and Damian knocks out Robin's Tim Drake, leaving him bleeding on the floor of the Batcave, and donning a version of his costume when he goes to confront his father, letting him know that he is ready to replace Tim as Robin. Batman ends up returning and retrieving Tim, helping to fix up the damage that Damien did to him. Eventually, these two would move past this feud, but for a while there, it was basically life threatening. Number 6, Daredevil and Punisher. Daredevil and the Punisher are usually seen to be friends and allies, but because of their difference in opinions when it comes to how best to handle super heroic issues, they are sometimes known to be rivals of one another as well. This element of their relationship is especially highlighted in the Netflix Daredevil series where we are first introduced to this world's live action representation of the Punisher. Here, Matt Murdock disagrees with Punisher's tactics, believing he should not kill his enemies or people who get in his way of tracking down his true enemies, whereas the Punisher believes the people he kills deserve it. Although both see the other as a hero of sorts, there are times when they look down on one another or condemn them for their methods. In in fact, Frank Castle has likely thought before that Daredevil is not harsh enough when it comes to the way that he doles out justice. Number 5, Cyclops and Wolverine. Wolverine has had quite the luck with the ladies over his incredibly long history, but despite that, he couldn't seem to let one girl go. That girl was Jean Grey. Jean Grey has pretty consistently declined the advances of our short temperamental Canadian in favor of her boo, Scott Summers, the consistent leader of the X-Men, Cyclops. They just make for a better couple, despite Scott being kind of the worst sometimes. And Wolverine? He just can't stand that fact. He is pretty consistent even to the point of being problematic with his advances towards Jean despite her constant rejection. And Cyclops is no pushover. He is, or I guess was, a boy scout, but he is also a pretty strong willed leader and not someone who takes behavior like Wolverine's lightly, which has led to many clashes between the two over the years. Pretty immature rivalry over the their teammate, which has gotten bloody on way too many occasions and is pretty disrespectful to the third person involved, starts as a basis, but over their history, these two have butted heads over more important things. For example, there was a pretty serious difference of opinions in how the X-Men and the students of the school they are an integral part of should be led, causing the schism story. Or there was the whole X-Men versus Avengers thing where Wolverine seemed to choose the other heroes over his own mutant family. Number 4, Green Arrow and Arsenal. Oliver Queen and Roy Harper's falling out as one-time partners is a bit of a tragic ordeal, and it's mainly because of Roy's infamous decline into the world of substance abuse. 
Originally, Roy was Green Arrow's first sidekick, Speedy. He was an orphan that Oliver Queen took in. Oliver basically raised Roy. Roy would also join up with the Teen Titans, and he had a good thing going as a member of the Teen Titans, even dating Donna Troy. But a while later, the Titans disbanded, he broke up with Donna Troy, and Oliver ran into serious financial troubles and basically started neglecting Roy, going off around the country with Green Lantern and Black Canary. This was the trigger that sent him down the path of addiction. Oliver came back from a mission to find Roy red handed and instead of supporting or comforting his adoptive son, Oliver disowned him, kicked him out on the streets and gave him a swift punch to the face. As you can imagine, this led to a lot of resentment between the two and Roy struck out on his own, struggling all the while with his issues. He would go on to become Arsenal and eventually Red Arrow, with the bad blood between him and his adopted dad being smoothed over eventually, but those problems of his addiction and Green Arrow's knack for abandoning Roy came back with a vengeance. Now I gotta change the subject because it's honestly, it's honestly pretty depressing. Let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. Number three, Tim Drake and Damian Wayne. Of all the Robins, Tim and Damian have had the most touchy of relationships. It all started when they first met. Tim Drake was the Robin, and Damian, being the son of Batman, decided that apparently the only way to claim what he called his birthright of the Robin mantle was to literally try and take Tim's life, which is a perfect indication of why he was not at all suited to be the Robin. The little psycho. Damian laid an unholy beat down on Tim with his much more advanced combat skills, almost bringing Tim to the pearly gates. Luckily, he didn't actually achieve this, but it set a tone for the rivalry between these two, especially as they both took on the Robin mantle. As a side note, Tim had to earn Bruce's love. He worked for it, and with his father Jack, he also had to work for that. For Tim, love is something you have to earn and is never unconditional. And this little jumped up spoiled brat of comes in here talking about his birthright with Bruce actually giving Damien the love that he didn't really earn. It rubbed Tim the wrong way. Eventually, Damien claimed the Robin title solely for himself and Tim set off as just Red Robin. They've also repaired the relationship somewhat, but of the members of the Bat Family, I think there is always tension between these two. Number 2, Spider-Man and Venom. Now this may seem like a cop out because, well it kinda is. Venom was one of Spider-Man's greatest villains, basically the literal antithesis to Spider-Man. Venom had almost an obsession for Spider-Man, like a really, really dangerous symbiotic ex-girlfriend. Venom almost pined for the connection he lost with Spider-Man. When the rejected alien bonded with Eddie Brock, whose life was arguably ruined by both his own and Spider-Man's actions, the combo made for a deadly villain who hated Spider-Man with almost every fiber of his being. When Venom started to lean into the role of being an anti-hero, the only real reason these two began to leave each other alone was because Venom moved across the whole country to San Francisco. I guess they just needed some space because over time they began to accept each other, becoming reluctant allies at times, especially in the absolute carnage story, which finally began to see their relationship heal. Eventually, in the aftermath of the King in Black story, almost seeing each other as brothers. The tension is still in the air to a degree if you ask me, and crazy exes be like that sometimes. Number 1. Emma Frost and Jean Grey Jean Grey and Emma Frost. They are powerful female heroes amongst teams of predominantly male heroes and they are not afraid to show just how capable they are. They are so similar and yet so different, which naturally leads to both friendship and rivalry at the same time. Emma Frost is known for being cunning, assertive, and brutally blunt. She's also no stranger to going a little dark. Jean Grey, on the other hand, is known for being more empathetic, gentle, and kind. Except when she was Dark Phoenix. When they first met in the Dark Phoenix saga, Emma was literally part of the villainous Hellfire Club that manipulated Jean to become the Dark Phoenix in the first place. It is not a good way to start a working relationship. Then there is the pretty large fact that these two share a big old love triangle with Cyclops. I think it's safe to say that Cyclops prefers Jean. She is the one who is consistently stuck in his heart. But that didn't seem to stop him from basically telepathically cheating on Jean with Emma. And then actually being with Emma when him and Jean broke up and Jean died. But like I said, Jean was always in his heart, which doomed him and Emma from the start. Emma Frost and Jean Grey have continuously argued and battled over a wide array of issues throughout their history, but at the end of the day, these two women are actually friends. Friends that have genuine respect for each other and who have had each other's back. They even teamed up together to save Aurora Monroe, Storm, at one point, which displayed both their strengths and weaknesses as incredibly similar but starkly different mutants. Number 10, Wonder Man. 
I mean, Wonder Man was literally the guy to organize the Revengers team. This happened because Wonder Man, aka Simon Williams, believed after years and years of having a rough go, to put it lightly, that the Avengers were actually to blame for pretty much all the negative parts of his life. He decided ultimately that the Avengers had to be stopped and put a team together known as the Revengers. The Revengers were literally created to take out the Avengers, and they almost succeeded too. At first, Wonder Man's Revengers attacked the new Avengers team. While initially the new Avengers held their own, ultimately the Revengers prevailed and actually won that fight. Confident in their ability, the Revengers then headed for the main Avenger team. This is where they ended up failing, with Wonder Man being imprisoned while in his ionic form. Let's also not forget that Wonder Man was initially introduced as a supervillain, who himself fought against the Avengers to begin with, so he also literally started out as an antagonist to them. Albeit one who was eventually redeemed and ended up ultimately joining the team he had been sent to destroy. But you know, he's got a long history with them. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we're doing here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. Number 9. Young Avengers Hate might be a strong word here considering that the Young Avengers, you know, are inspired by the main Avengers team, but you can't deny that the Young Avengers at least have some beef with the team that inspired them. At least, you know, they did when they first formed. The Young Avengers, as inspiring teen heroes, actually wanted to learn from their mentors and sought to be trained by them, actually reaching out to the Avengers. However, when they tried to reach out to, you know, get training and get some help and pointers, they ended up being turned away, with Captain America actually refusing to teach them anything initially and even attempting to discourage their attempt to become heroes. In fact, initially the Avengers even tried to prevent the Young Avengers from facing Kang, and even sided with Kang against the Young Avengers member Iron Lad. Kang had, in essence, shown the Avengers some awful visions of the potential future, were Iron Lad not to fulfill his destiny in becoming Kang, and the Avengers were basically convinced by this. Fortunately, the Young Avengers weren't so easy to lock away, so they managed to escape confinement and prepare for the battle against Kang. Although Iron Lad would ultimately return to his own timeline, resigned to become Kang one day. Times have changed, and the Young Avengers have largely become accepted by the Avengers who came before, but the start there, it was kind of rocky. Number 8. Hulkling During the beginning of Empire, you could definitely argue that Hulkling kind of hated the Avengers, at least for a moment, considering that they were siding with the Alliance's enemies, the Kotati. However, once the Avengers learned the truth of the Kotati's plans and their vendetta to, in essence, destroy all organic life, it became clear to them that the Alliance were actually more the side to ally with in this intergalactic fight. In fact, the whole reason reason that Hulkling had in essence been able to bring together the long warring empires of both the Skrull and the Kree to create the alliance other than you know his parentage being a Kree Skrull hybrid born both of Skull royalty and a celebrated Kree war hero was because of this unified threat the Kotati number 7 Spider-Man while Spider-Man has himself been an avenger that doesn't mean he's always seen eye to eye with the team or always gotten along with them. In fact, at one point they kind of betrayed his trust, or at least, you know, one of them did. Yep, I'm talking about Iron Man during Civil War, the first Civil War baby. It was during Civil War that Spider-Man was convinced by Tony Stark to reveal his true identity to the world as part of a push for the Superhuman Registration Act, revealing that Spider-Man, aka Peter Parker, stood with Iron Man, aka Tony Stark, and supported the act. Stark believed that for a Accountability's sake, it was actually really important to reveal their civilian identities to the public. Of course, this almost immediately backfired, with a hit being put out on Peter, and after an attack on his life went wrong, and May ending up in critical care. It would ultimately be Peter's choice to side with Avenger Tony Stark that would result in Mary Jane and himself making a deal with Mephisto to restore Peter's secret identity and save Aunt May in exchange for their marriage. So, yeah. Number 6. Miss Marvel Carol Danvers, now known as Captain Marvel, has had a complicated history with mutant kind, to put it mildly. Initially, her powers were stolen by then-mutant villain Rogue. Rogue didn't even really mean to actually steal Carol's powers per se, it was kind of just a result of her attacking Carol that this happened because, I mean, that's what Rogue does, those are his, her powers. She like 
takes the power away from people, takes their life energy, and you know, at the time her powers were very volatile and uncontrollable. She since has come into her own and even has become a hero, and is actually more well known for being a hero than a villain at this point I'd say. And well, even after Rogue became a hero, many of her powers, to this day even, still came and come from Carol Danvers, who was then known as Miss Marvel, there has also been a history of friendship with Carol and the X-Men team. Professor X and the X-Men actually took Carol in after she lost her memories and her powers following her interaction with Rogue. And Carol actually fought alongside the X-Men as part of their team for quite some time, basically being an ally to them, despite not even being a mutant. But she has definitely had a big beef with Rogue in the past, and Rogue has been an X-Man. We cannot deny either of these facts, so hence why she's on this list. Number 5. The Fantastic Four We discussed how much Reed Richards seems to dislike the mutants on part 1 of this list, and while Adam also touched upon all the times the FF have actually worked alongside the mutant team as their allies, as has Reed, remember when he made Dazzler that super pocket radio? Super cool. The whole team has actually gone up against the X-Men multiple times. In fact, they have two miniseries that are kind of based around that idea. The first one is from the 80s, Fantastic Four vs. the X-Men pretty like on the nose there with the title. And the second is more recent from 2020, titled simply X-Men slash Fantastic Four. But it's less about X-Men and Fantastic Four coming together and a little bit more about why they clash with each other, at least at the beginning. The second ends with Professor X literally wiping Reed's mind of the knowledge of how to remove the X gene. No matter the reason, I don't think any of the FF would be down with involuntary mind wipes of any of their teammates, Reed included. Probably especially Reed. I mean, he needs that. He needs his mind to do science. <laughs> Number 4, Punisher. The Punisher has an ongoing feud with one specific X-Man and that's generally Wolverine. While the two have also teamed up together in the past, their relationship is often depicted as being rocky at best, and the two have come to blows multiple times. I would call this one more of an ongoing rivalry or feud that is mainly fueled by writers and fans who bicker about, you know, which one of them is the toughest around. Which one of them is the toughest guy? That's me being a fan that's just bickering about tough guys. Although I've definitely done that before and I don't sound like that when I do it. Or do I sound like that? Maybe I do. Personally, I would say Wolverine is tough for if I'm getting into that bickering argument debate with fellow nerds, both mentally and literally. But I also respect those who take Frank's side. After all, Frank is still a super tough person, and I'm not going to try to argue that he's not. Still really tough, so fair if you prefer Frank. Number 3, The Inhumans. We've now talked about Black Bolt and Medusa specifically on the channel, but the Inhumans in general kind of have good reason to hate the X-Men, thanks to mostly Emma Frost. Initially, the Inhumans were actually trying to cancel the feud with the X-Men in Inhumans vs. X-Men, also known by the short form name of IVX. Truly, this story was a little bonkers in regards to, you know, making the conflict here make sense, but hey, if editorial comes to you and they say this is a story that has to happen, you kind of have to come up with some reason, so I don't even think we can blame creatives on this one. Because I'm pretty sure this story came from editorial wanting it to happen, not creatives pitching it. The reason we were given here for this weird fight is that the Terrigen Mists were released on Earth but ended up acting as basically a poison to the mutants. As such, the X-Men and mutant kind felt very targeted and they did some not so cool things in response to try to hurt the Inhumans. Emma Frost led the charge and she pumped everyone up by staging a telepathic public death of Cyclops, which wasn't real, he had already died at that point, and this whole thing was blown out of proportion when the Inhumans initially kind of actually tried to resolve this issue peacefully, but were attacked when they attempted to even extend an olive branch, which incited the war between the two groups. So while they didn't want to hate the mutants initially, that wasn't their goal here, it certainly did turn out that way by the end, or at least by the midway through the story. Though really, everyone turned on Emma when they learned how she'd manipulated them, the mutants, into fighting against the Inhumans, because yeah, not a great look for Emma Frost. Number 2, Hulk. Hulk is well known for his beef with Wolverine. I mean, Wolverine literally first appeared in a Hulk comic where, you know, he was the villain, or at the very least he was the antagonist of that tale. Hulk also at one point attacked the mutants during World War Hulk. Granted, he had less of a beef with the X-Men than he did with their at one time mentor, Professor X, who he wanted due to his 
connection with the Illuminati because at that time the Hulk was like the Illuminati messed up my life. But still, the fact that the X-Men were not involved in what had happened to Hulk on the planet Sakaar did not stop him from attacking other mutants initially. They basically had to shame Hulk into walking away in order to survive that fight. And even then, Hulk seemed like he didn't really want to back down. And of course, there have been other mutants in the past who have come to blows with Hulk besides. So. It's not even the only time that this has happened or the only folks that have been affected. Number one, Avengers. I mean, we touched on it a bit on part one of this list when Adam talked about Captain America and Iron Man. He even talked about another few Avengers as well that have beefed with the X-Men and mutant kind in general on his part one. If you want to know who exactly was included, I highly recommend checking it out. But I digress. You've probably heard of a little well-known event called Avengers vs. X-Men. This event stood to highlight some of the feuds between the two teams and their individual members that have been brewing for basically years. Chiefly though, the fight was over the Phoenix Force in terms of the story here. The Phoenix was returning to bond with, as the mutants believed, its current ideal host, Hope Summers. The Avengers wanted it gone. The two fought each other. Which now seems ironic since although the Phoenix has long been linked to mutants and mutant based stories and the Avengers were very anti Phoenix at that time, the Avengers now work with the Phoenix themselves as the Force is currently bonded with Avenger member Echo. So love how they thought about it and then they were just like, well, that's uh, you know, now we're gonna use the Phoenix, now it's our buddy. Weird. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I was raised to believe that the word hate is a very strong word, so I'd more say that these are characters or groups who have actively had in my terms, a strong dislike for the X-Men or mutants in general at one point. Number 10, Scarlet Witch. Okay, so Scarlet Witch might not be as hated as some when it comes to the general public, but she sure has had her share of hate when it comes to the mutant population. In issue number seven of 2019's X-Men, mutants even express their hate as part of a ceremonial rite of passage called the Crucible that involves revisiting her story. Young mutants who have likely only experienced what happened as a a story, profess their hatred for Wanda and call her Pretender. Pretender, pretend her. I hate her so much. I hate her so much. And I'm like, no, she wasn't meaning to be a pretender. And before this, Rogue was the one who led the charge when it came to the mutant community, blaming Scarlet Witch. Rightly, albeit maybe not fairly, for the whole M Day ordeal and threatening the very existence of mutant kind. Number nine, Thor and the Avengers. During the Fear Itself event, Thor was struggling with his place in the world. He was hated because the events of Siege, while not his fault directly, had not only caused destruction in Asgard, but also in neighboring Earth residing communities. Many of the people living in one of the towns resented the superhero community for causing danger to come to them. We've seen this a lot actually in movies and comics too. Some had their homes destroyed and couldn't even afford to rebuild, choosing to sell and move out rather than stay and wait for the superheroes to attempt to save the day again and help them rebuild. Not all of the town felt this way, but then a coming war between Midgard and Asgard also was approaching, fueling some of the hate from the public in regards to Thor and the Avengers. Avengers team. Of course, Asgard was only aiming to destroy Earth to prevent the serpent from feasting on all of the human spheres and becoming even more powerful. But this only added insult to injury as the serpent, you know, was also already bent on conquering and devouring Earth himself. I mean, Thor recovered, but this was a pretty tough time for the Thunder God and a pretty tough time to be anyone from Asgard or any sort of Norse mythology. In the end, it was really only his self-sacrifice that managed to redeem him. Cause he died. But then he is, then he was okay. You know how it goes. Number eight, Silk. Silk is Cindy Moon. She has similar powers to Peter Parker's Spider-Man, including a built-in danger sense, but she can actually also produce her own organic webbing, which I think actually is really cool. This is probably the least gross, I think. She even sometimes uses the skill to spin herself a disposable silk suit spider costume. After her and Peter dated or hooked up for a bit, she ended up settling back into her own life and searching for her family. She had been locked up in a bunker for years, long story. Anyways, like Peter much later on, she also got some of the J. Jonah Jameson treatment when it came to her superhero persona of Silk. Though even Jameson himself very much liked Cindy for a time in volume one of her series when she was working for him. Number seven, Green Lantern. When comics made the choice to turn Hal Jordan into Parallax and had him basically threaten the entire DC universe, they also created a world of hate for him. With some readers, but mostly within the comic book world. And especially in the realms of the superhero community. Even today, more than 20 years later, people still bring this up in the comics. People are not over it. They're like, remember that time you pretty much like almost killed everybody? 
He's like, geez, guy can't get over that stuff. Number six, Spider-Man. He's a menace. At least that's what JJ would have us think. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of people in New York read the Daily Bugle and trust what it has to say. So when they do stories about Spider-Man being a criminal, a murderer, a dang menace, people are inclined to believe those words, which has led to a lot of problems for Spider-Man. And let's not forget the amount of times people have tried to frame him. Right from the beginning, Chameleon himself tried that ploy, and we've seen it happen a few more times in the comics as well. He's just so frameable, Spider-Man, isn't he? Number five, Bishop and Gambit. This duo have also butt heads ever since they first met. Bishop comes from a future where the X-Men have perished after being betrayed by one of their own, and mutants were put into concentration camps. I said that like I didn't know I wrote it, but I just felt like it sounded harsh. He met a man called The Witness, who refused to give his name and claimed to know the story of the X-Men, saying that he was the last one to see them alive. He also went by LeBeau, and it was his similarity to Gambit that instantly made Bishop hate and not trust him. While I understand Bishop's reaction, he just continued to not trust Gambit for pretty much forever. Even when the two are forced to work together, he continued to insult and berate Gambit, often putting both of them at risk due to ignoring Gambit's suggestions while on missions, just because they came from him. I also really don't think that the witness was the traitor. This is a silly grudge because it is based on so many assumptions. Number four, Reed and Namor. Cyclops and Wolverine may be fighting over Jean, but it is this fight over a paramour that really takes the cake. Oftentimes when I bring up Namor, I put him in either category, villain or superhero. In truth, he's really an anti-hero, but he has a few times been an interesting nemesis to the Fantastic Four, or at the very least, Reed Richards. Namor is head over heels in love with Susan Storm, which has put the two at odds, with Richards often presented as Sue's savior, and Namor the awful brute from the sea, who is coming to carry her away. But not always. Sometimes Susan seems to actually want to be with Namor, and with a neglectful husband like Reed Richards, I can't really say that I blame her. Namor and Susan have shared a few kisses and long romantic looks, but in the end she always comes back to Reed. Number 3, Superman and the Flash. For some reason, Superman has this crazy obsession with beating the Flash at his own thing, being fast. Well, you may think I'm exaggerating here. I mean, there have been a few times where Superman actually just wanted to catch Flash because he was being mind controlled or, you know, was going to run to his death or needed some sense talked into him. I can guarantee you that there are many, many panels and instances that point to the fact that Superman just really wants to be faster. He has also had countless foot races with countless flashes, and almost every time he's either tied or lost, with more losses than ties. Yet even though they have been racing since the 60s, in 2011, Superman is chasing Barry Allen's Flash in Superman issue 709, and is still seen wondering to himself in a panel, which of them is faster? Give it up Superman, it's not you. Quit trying to take this one thing away from the Flash, you have a million other things you're superior at. Jeez. Number two, Hawkeye and Winter Soldier. Are you surprised by this one? I know I am. Hawkeye and Winter Soldier have something in common, beyond both being superheroes. Super, in Hawkeye's case. They are both exes of Natasha Romanoff, aka Black Widow. The two are pulled together in the tales of suspense, Hawkeye and the Winter Soldier series, to track down whoever is killing Natasha's old enemies, following Black Widow's death. It is clear from the way they interact that they do not want to be working together, that they do not trust each other, and that they actually hate each other. Well, I get it that trying to get along with your ex's ex is probably pretty weird. What I do not get is that they later reveal that they have kind of always hated one another. Which means this feud predates their time dating Natasha? What? But why? So this rivalry is kind of based around them sharing an ex, but also just based around I guess them both existing. Number one, Wolverine and Deadpool. These two have a long standing rivalry for almost no reason. They often fight just to fight. At one point in the comics, Deadpool fights Wolverine because a doctor prescribed him to fight a superhero to help fix his hallucinations. Another brutal fight they have ends with Wolverine offering to buy Deadpool a beer. Mostly, these two fight just because they can. They both have insane regeneration factors, which means they can usually take the fight as far as they want and make it as violent as they desire, and still both be fine. It is a really strange relationship. Of course, Deadpool does take it far enough to kill Wolverine when he brings a car 
Robin Adium's sword to take him on when he kills the entire Marvel verse. But don't worry, that death is not part of the main continuity. Wolverine is fine. Beyond this, there is also the hilarious rivalry that translated weirdly to the X Men Wolverine Origins film, and beyond that, the Deadpool movies, where Deadpool just enjoys poking fun at Logan. I suspect the two might actually secretly be BFFs. Number 10, Batman and Green Lanterns. I don't know about you guys, but I have always sort of loved how Batman and various different Green Lanterns just kind of never get along. Actually, he has this weird thing against Green Arrow as well. I'm, I'm thinking maybe Bruce just hates the color green in general. No, it usually has more to do with the attitudes and personalities of the individuals themselves. So, for example, Batman and Guy Gardner had a pretty obvious disdain for each other when they were both part of Justice League International, and it eventually led to Batman straight up punching the lights out of Guy Gardner. Now, to be fair, no one likes Guy Gardner, he's just kind of the worst. Even the rest of the Justice League International were like, yeah, that guy needs to shut up. And they all left for their mission after Batman knocked him out, just leaving him laying there on the floor. There was also the time Hal Jordan came back to life after the little parallax thing happened, and Batman did not trust this guy one bit. Batman kept getting in the way of Hal, who was trying to actually go and defeat Parallax properly. In this case, it was Hal who did the punching, and, and Batman kind of deserved it, but he still got his, his, his comeuppance for that one. Also, when the Justice League came together for the first time in the newer continuities, I think after New 52, Batman was just like a little sneaky prankster to Hal and stole the power ring off him just to be like, I'm better than you. It's kind of hilarious. Batman has also scolded Green Lantern Simon Baz for carrying a blam blam, and he's had shouting matches and beat the snot out of Green Arrow for speaking up against Batman. It's a bit of a lighter rivalry, but I swear he's got something against the color green. I, I think it's a fact. Number 9, Aquaman and Black Manta. While Aquaman has two major villains with Ocean Master and Black Manta, the latter of the two just goes the extra sadistic step with this villainy. Black Manta is a man who will go into and come out of retirement based on whether Aquaman is around or not, and the rivalry has just gotten more and more personal for them both over the years. In fact, it kind of rivals all other rivalries, but it is Aquaman, and as much as we all love Jason Momoa, Aquaman it just ain't that cool, man. He just ain't that cool. He has been, I don't deny it, and the Aquaman stands are going to come at me for this one, but if you like him, let me know in the comments and give me three reasons why that don't stem from the fact that everybody hates on him. But back to the point, Aquaman was convinced that Black Manta was responsible for the passing of Aquaman's dad. And he very well might have been, but Arthur's quest for vengeance on that one brought about the accidental end of Manta's dad. So, of course, Manta needed his revenge, and so he pitted Aquaman against Aqualad by trapping Arthur's wee bab in a bubble of air, causing it to suffocate if the Aqua allies didn't duke it out. And even though they totally did duke it out, it didn't stop anything. And then, even later on, Aquaman even took on Manta's son as a protege, which is like a huge huge insult to the villain who is arguably your number one rival. That part was actually kind of cool, I'll give Aquaman that one. That, that one thing that you did was kind of cool. Also when you had the hook for your arm, that was cool too. Number 8, Black Lightning and Tobias Whale. Black Lightning simply does not get enough love, but his comics and even the show are actually pretty cool. His main rival, Tobias Whale, was the leader of the gang called the 100, and Jefferson Pierce, Black Lightning, decided that he was going to become pretty outspoken against this group, which prompted Whale to take out one of Pierce's students. This is what created Black Lightning in the first place, but it wasn't the only beef the two shared. Pretty much like Aquaman, Whale had a large hand in the passing of Pierce's dad. After a while, the rivalry would actually travel over to Gotham City where Tobias decided to try and establish himself there and he and his gang were a bit too much for Black Lightning who had to call on Superman for help, which I also think is kind of lame. He could have definitely handled it on his own. But I mean, where Black Lightning called on Superman, there was a time that Tobias called on a demonic entity, so I mean, tit for tat, I guess. If you haven't already, be sure to drop a like on this video if you like it. Your support really helps us out. Also, we have another video that goes over some of Marvel's biggest rivalries as well, so definitely check that out. But in at number 7 is Deathstroke and the Teen Titans. If you have watched the animated Teen Titans series, then you know their number one most persistent villain is Deathstroke Slade Wilson. His cunning, intense, immoral way of completing his missions have made him incredibly hard to bring down, 
even compared to other massive threats the Titans face. But over time, guess what? Yes, that's right, it became hella personal. Deathstroke's son, Ravager, had his life ruined after Starfire crashed into his apartment. And then Ravager and Deathstroke fought the Titans together until Ravager passed away in his own dad's arms, which then compounded Deathstroke's hate for the Titans since he blamed them for it. And then we have the massive can of worms known as the Judas Contract. Here, the Titans welcome a new member onto the team who ends up being Rose Wilson, the daughter of Slade. She goes and betrays the team and takes up the Ravager moniker after her brother and that also ended not very well. It's just a whole whack of hate composed in one person. Deathstroke. I'm talking about Deathstroke. Number 6. Superman and Brainiac Finally, a rivalry that isn't predominantly fueled by personal tragedy. No, in this instance the rivalry is just so good because it brings out a whole other side of the Man of Steel. His intelligent side. Whenever Superman goes up against Brainiac, his incredible strength begins to fall at the wayside. Brainiac has even beaten the Man of Steel a few times, and what's interesting is that Brainiac is actually the one here who has made a bunch of personal blows on the Man of Steel. Usually it's a bit more fair with heroes also making a few mistakes, but because Superman is DC's golden boy, we can't have him messing up too much now, can we? Or if he does, it had better be in an alternate storyline. Brainiac shrank Kandor and Krypton and carried them around as part of his collection. Another time Brainiac had Superman distracted which opened the door for him to get at Jonathan Kent. Superman has teamed up with General Zod against Brainiac. It goes that far sometimes. But my absolute favorite Brainiac moment is probably one of his kind of smaller ones. It's actually in Superman Red Sun, but I'll let you check that out for yourself because I'm moving on. Number 5. Deadpool While movie going audiences may love Deadpool, not everybody does. Not only is he considered a major menace within the superhero community, who no one really wants to team up with, sadly, but his disregard for human life and his violent nature also make him feared by your average civilians in the comic book world as well. Number 4. Booster Gold Although he does for a time end up achieving celebrity status, Booster Booster Gold is still probably one of the least liked superheroes across the board in the DC Universe, likely because his heroics all appear to be for the fame. This doesn't of course stop him from becoming famous, but once people find out that he's kind of a sham with stolen future tech and, and yet a man from the future with really no relevant information to share with those in the past, many of the public often seem to be finding themselves rolling their eyes at him as much as the superhero community does. So really no one likes Booster Gold, poor dude. Number 3. Batman Now I know what you're thinking, wait, but everybody loves Batman. I would offer that more people fear him than love the bat, and while he may be remarked as a hero by civilians in Gotham, this isn't always the case. In Christopher Nolan's Batman universe, Batman even had to go into hiding at the end of Dark Knight after choosing to take the fall for murders attached to Harvey Dent's descent into madness and transformation into Two-Face. Even though Commissioner Gordon knew Batman was innocent, he was forced to pretend to pursue him and publicly label Batman a criminal and a murderer. Batman himself understood the importance of maintaining the faith people had in Dent and in the system. To protect Gotham from devolving into chaos like the Joker wanted, the system and those who operated within it needed to be viewed as the real heroes at this time. And in many alternate universes, not everyone who has played the role of Batman has acted as heroically as the main continuity Bruce Wayne has. In the Tales from the Dark Multiverse series, we get to see a world where Azrael stayed as Batman and turned Gotham into an ironclad, fascist ruled dystopian night. Nightmare. And in this reality, even when Bruce does get the title back, his views and approach appear to be just as bleak and horrifying. It's like, oh, actually, maybe now Bruce is worse. Bruce got messed up. Yo, that whole series is messed up. If you guys want to read something messed up, go read it. Number two, X Men. Or rather, really, just all of mutant kind, even. Any superhero that is a mutant is automatically hated just for being a mutant. Why? Because racism. Although mutants were originally created from a writing standpoint to get rid of the nuisance of an origin story, explaining away any need for one with the simple phrase, they're a mutant, people quickly started drawing parallels between mutants and the civil rights movement, which was really heating up at the time. Although it's hard to pin down the exact starting date, a big moment for the civil rights movement first happened in 1955, when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus in Montgomery. The first issue 
of Uncanny X-Men was released in 1963, eight years later, and people's minds started to unite the two causes, making the fictional mutants the parallel for all the real world races that had experienced racism. And people's minds started to unite the two causes, making the fictional mutants the parallel for all real world minorities that had experienced racism. As such, the mutants themselves have to face a bigger world of hate in the comics since their introduction, fighting the good fight for mutant rights. They likely have had actually more hate groups than one could even count. I don't even know how many hate groups they had. I, no, I know it's a lot. I could definitely list at least 10 of them. Number one. Watchmen. In the series Watchmen, superheroes are constantly criticized. Originally, the supers actually had to agree to disband due to the public's opinions of their existence. Ozymandias' whole plan is to put supers back on top, creating a situation where they can be seen as saving the day, and in saving the world after kind of terrifying it, bringing everyone together to create a time of peace. Part of his plan is even to make Dr. Manhattan hated by everyone to get him out of his way, which worked. That, that worked pretty well. Also, Dr. Manhattan is just kind of like, Humanity, what is that? But even Adrian Veidt's brilliant master plan doesn't end up panning out when Rorschach's journals are published, revealing that Ozymandias was the one responsible for the alien squid attack on New York. As a result, supers become even more hated, and Adrian Veidt is forced to go into hiding. So, really, the Watchmen universe, just no one likes the Watchmen. I mean, I like the Watchmen, but I don't count. Coming in at number 10 is Deadpool. Deadpool is a bit of a shocking way to kick off this list. He himself is like almost a mutant, but not actually a mutant, but he also says he's a mutant, but is then corrected by the actual mutants, and then sometimes people classify him as a mutant, but then others will classify him as not one. Do you understand why it's a little confusing? His mutant healing factor was derived from Wolverine's own, and he became who he is thanks to Weapon X, which are notorious for working on mutants. But whether he is a mutant or not, one thing is definitely true. Despite the fact that Wade has tried to count himself among their numbers, Deadpool finds the X-Men to just be a little too annoying for his own tastes. And that feeling basically just stems from the fact that they take things way too seriously, where he takes almost nothing seriously, which means when he does work with them, it's usually not for a very long time. To say Deadpool hates anyone feels kind of wrong. I think he's just kind of insane, but he definitely finds them annoying. Number nine, Black Bolt. The Inhumans are essentially a species of mutants created by the Kree experimenting on humans a long, long time ago. One of the ways the Inhumans came to be was through the Terrigen Mists. When they're exposed to the mist, they gained powers and they would become an Inhuman. Unfortunately, a cloud of Terrigen Mists found its way to Earth, and it turns out that these mists are incredibly deadly for the mutant population. The mutants eventually learned that they could change the composition of the mist in order to make it safe for mutants, but at the cost of not creating more Inhumans. The problem is, they didn't actually make sure that was okay to do with the Inhumans. They just started attacking the Inhumans, causing a conflict and causing Black Bolt to use his scream to take down Cyclops. This resulted in Emma Frost using Dazzler to attack Black Bolt and leave him imprisoned in limbo and without the ability to use his powers. The worst part is that if the X-Men just talked to the Inhumans, which they eventually do, the Inhumans are totally cool with figuring out a resolution. So I'm kind of on Black Bolt's side with this one. Look, I definitely know some of these choices will split people's opinions, so this is a perfect opportunity to invite you down to the comments to make sure you let me know your thoughts on my opinions here. I'm giving you my takes with examples, so I'd love to hear your well-informed opinions. Coming in at number eight is Blade. Blade is someone who sometimes feels like he's relegated to his own corner of the Marvel Universe, a fact that he and mutants technically kind of share. But Blade is also pretty damn ruthless. His main self-appointed purpose in life is to eradicate vampires. It's what he lives for. But when one of those vampires is also a mutant, then it causes some discourse. During the X-Men Curse of the Mutants, the X-Men, and more specifically Cyclops, ask this vampire slayer for his expertise and assistance in dealing with their vampire problem. When the depowered mutant Jubilee was turned into a vampire though, Blade wanted to exterminate her, straight up, which shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone. But Blade also shouldn't have been surprised that the X-Men were not down for this course of action. The disagreement may not have been Blade hates the X-Men, but going to a vampire slayer and expecting him not to do what he does is a little annoying, don't you think? I think so. Number seven, Wasp. Look, you may not agree with me on this one, and that's fine. 
But I will source one point of evidence that Wasp does not have a favorable view of the X-Men and mutants in general. In Uncanny Avengers, which followed the X-Men vs. Avengers arc and ended with the passing of Xavier at the hands of Cyclops, Captain America decided that the best way to repair things was to put more mutants onto the Avengers and have the new team, led by Alex Summers, Havoc. That's Cap cherry picking the best looking mutants to represent them, but the addition of a few mutants to the Avengers under the ideology of a Professor X meant that some things changed around the Avengers mansion. Like when Rogue tried to replace a painting of the original Avengers with a painting of Xavier. It's in a bit of poor taste, sure, but when Wasp walked in on it happening, she was more than a little upset. And it seemed genuinely anti-mutant to me, just a little bit. And then she had this whole weird thing where she tried to design an X-Men themed clothing brand, including Cyclops themed glasses that seemed in poor taste, to help fund the Avengers. And she referred to UX types as being depressing and not optimistic. Then in issue number 8 of that series she makes another comment about the quote X-Men types and how they are keeping secrets. She just makes all these little snide comments about the mutant members of the team. She definitely has some kind of hate going on here. I don't care what you say, it's true. Wasp acts like all mutants are superheroes, for sure, but superheroes who don't know what they're doing. And that's rude. And it's six elongated man. Now, at least within the context of the show, Barry Allen and Ralph Dibney, aka Elongated Man, did not like each other when he was introduced. Ralph Dibney is a former police detective of the Central City Police Department and a private investigator. He was fired after Barry contemplating evidence to ensure the conviction of a man who Dibney was certain was guilty, but of course, planting evidence is illegal and it got him thrown off the force, because, you know, Barry reported him, causing him to have to turn into being a pretty piss poor PI, honestly, but also starting to hate Barry. And Barry hated him, due to not only his own strong sense of justice, but also the fact that his father was an innocent man in, in prison for a crime that he didn't commit. So you can kind of see how planting false evidence would kind of trigger some anger. In the pre-Flashpoint timeline though, Ralph was one of the people who lost their lives during the Star Labs particle accelerator explosion. However, he reappeared alive in the post-Flashpoint timeline, gaining his powers due to exposure to dark matter from the Speed Force thanks to the Thinker's timing. Using these powers, Ralph joined Team Flash and began acting as a metahuman vigilante and superhero, initially referred to by the media as Stretchy Man, but shortly thereafter being dubbed the Elongated Man. Thank God for that. He and Barry then buried the hatchet, ironically, and left on good terms. Well, he left the show. Uh, not on good terms with the show, but on good terms with, like, the character wise, not the actors. It's a whole thing. Halfway through in number five, Vibe. After the creation and the reset of the Flashpoint timeline in season three of The Flash, there was some serious tension between Cisco Ramon, aka Vibe, and Barry. The result of this that was slowly revealed was that in this timeline, Cisco's brother Dante was killed in a car accident while this event never occurred in the original timeline. Dante's death affected Cisco greatly to the point where he would frequently ask the Barry of this timeline to travel back in time to save Dante from his death, although this Barry would always refuse, driving a wedge in the two's relationship. At some point after this though, Cisco began to attend regular talk therapy sessions to express his grief, and having realized what had gone wrong, Barry explained to Team Flash how he saved his mother and how he changed everyone's lives in the process, which only angered Cisco more. Because now he knew that Barry had saved a member of his own family, but refused to do it for a member of Cisco's. They eventually made up, but Cisco definitely hated Barry for a good chunk of this season, being at odds with him even during the invasion crossover event of that season until like the last part of it when Barry was going to sacrifice himself to the Dominators, and then Cisco's like, you're my friend, and I'm like, how does that clear everything up? But oh well, they had to do it. In it for Green Arrow. Oliver Queen, also known as Green Arrow, is arguably the most politically aware superhero in DC Comics. He advocates for the common people and doesn't have much patience for those who don't. And while he may not be the most powerful member of the Justice League, he is still important to the team, serving as a grounding force. In The Flash and Green Lantern Brave the Bold number 4, Oliver strongly disagrees with Barry and is just, there's, there's a whole thing. He's appalled by the brutality of the police system and is disappointed that Barry is not more aware of it. While Barry believes that the police keep law and order in the city. I mean, like, I guess it would make sense for him to have that view because he's a CSI, but he's also a superhero who's 
doing the cops job better than the cops. So Oliver thinks that the cops need to be monitored more closely and he wants Barry to see that and just not be naive about it. But yeah, it causes some conflict as you can uh, suspect if you've ever been on Twitter. Hal Jordan watches the arguments between the two, feeling powerless to intervene, but eventually they do reconcile their differences, but this clash of opinions was not resolved permanently. Green Arrow is a politically aware superhero who champions the common people. Yeah, when he disagrees with the Flash on the issues of police brutality and the like, he's definitely gonna cause some friction. Although this isn't a thing in the TV show, but I mean they also had to give Barry a mentor because <laughs> he had to figure out how to be a hero somehow. So right, getting close to the end in a number three Supergirl. In the new 52 storyline, Karzor L arrives on Earth to a world that she doesn't fully comprehend and that fully doesn't understand her. Despite Superman's attempts to help her integrate into society, she still feels like an outsider and yearns for her lost home. So when the Kryptonian villain Hell appears and promises to restore Krypton to its former glory, Kara eagerly joins him, unaware that she's just being manipulated and endangering Earth in the process. Despite the efforts of Superman, Wonder Woman, and the Flash to stop Hell, Kara fights alongside him, hating the Flash for his interference, being unable to understand why he and Kal-El won't let her go home. However, with the help of the Justice League, Kara eventually comes to see the truth and just realizes the danger that this villain possesses and that she's actually just being manipulated and he can't bring her home. So she ultimately abandons her misguided quest and chooses to stay on Earth. But again, she was fighting the Flash, so that's good enough for this list. Superheroes can't hate each other forever, otherwise how are they gonna do comics where they team up so that the DC can make more money, okay? Come on. But ultimately, in a number two, Jesse Quick. After acquiring speed powers through her father's formula, Jesse Quick desired to become a superhero. She crossed paths with Wally West, who started to train her, claiming that she could be his successor if anything ever happened to him. Jesse was thrilled with this, but her happiness was short-lived when she discovered that this was actually just a ploy. Wally was really using her to put pressure on Bart Allen, known as Impulse at the time, to take the mantle of the Flash more seriously. Jesse then felt betrayed by Wally's decision and came to loathe him, understandably. But despite her anger towards him, Jesse ultimately saved Wally's life but suffered significant injuries in the process. As Wally helped her recover, Jesse lost her powers, which she believed was due to Wally's actions, but was actually just the result of Savitar's interference. Nevertheless though, Jesse remained resentful towards Wally and did not like him because not only did he lie to her, use her, and then also get hurt in the process of trying to, to save him, she also lost her speed. So I get it, okay? I, I get why she would held a grudge against him even after saving his life. And finally, in at number one, Batman. Now, this may be a bit of a controversial pick, but on Red Death's home world of Earth negative 52, Batman hated Barry enough to steal his speed. Red Death is a speedster that is an evil combination of Batman and the Flash, which already sounds terrifying, but wait until you hear his story. The Bruce Wayne of Earth negative 52 started off fighting crime with Robin, but Robin's kept dying left, right, and center. So understandably, Batman got more and more darker, becoming more uh, extreme with his uh, methods, let's call them. Which honestly seems realistic to me, aside from just, you know, quitting fighting crime. But that can't happen because if they, he did, they wouldn't have a story, right? But this eventually leads him to Barry, who refuses to give Bruce his speed force powers. So Batman uses the various rogues weapons to fight Barry, knocking him out. And then once Barry was unconscious, Bruce tied him to the front of a cosmic treadmill modified Batmobile and drives them both into the speed force. I'm not even kidding, okay? I don't even know how that happened or like how it logically worked, but okay, you do you, Bat Marty. You need to go back to the future in your Bat DeLorean cosmic treadmill. But yeah, when entering the speed force, Barry and Bruce ended up fusing together into an evil Batman with super speed. Carnage and Joker. When it comes to Marvel and DC villain crossovers, many of you will probably first think of Joker's adversarial relationship with the Red Skull. But that one's been talked about a lot, and I'm also trying to limit the number of Joker entries on the list, so I'd rather talk about Joker's relationship with another Marvel villain, Cletus Cassidy, aka Carnage. In the Spider-Man and Batman comic of 1995, we get a story set on an alternate Earth where Spider-Man and Batman live in the same universe. Carnage 
Bridge in this story is a fan of the Joker, as he is the only other person who gets the joke that life is utterly meaningless, totally absurd, and madness is the only sane response. The two decide to start working together since they have so much in common, but things soon turn sour. Carnage soon becomes tired of Joker's complex and convoluted schemes, believing that it's more fun to just kill as many people as possible. Joker despises Carnage's lack of style, calling himself the Orson Welles of murder and comparing Carnage to David Hasselhoff. The two begin trying to kill each other, their team up over before it could ever really even begin. Number 9. Ultron and Doctor Doom During the events of the first Secret Wars, the villainous robot Ultron was destroyed by Galactus. His lifeless body was found by Doctor Doom, who saw the amazing opportunity in front of him and repaired the robot, programming it to be his loyal servant. Ultron served Doom for a while, but Doom eventually lost control of him. Ultron didn't take kindly to being forced to serve Doom and became the Latvian dictator's enemy. They have fought several times over the years and many of the possible futures shown in Marvel feature Doom and Ultron still locked in battle. In Avengers of the Wastelands number 1, Doom easily destroys Ultron who has retired to be a mechanic. The 2099 version of Doom was captured by Ultron and even teamed up with the Savage Avengers in order to get a chance to destroy his old enemy, showing that no matter what the timeline, these two simply will not get along. Number 8. Killer Croc and Bane During the infamous Nightfall arc, Bane enacted a plan to break Batman and take over Gotham City. While his plan is in progress, he sees Killer Croc on a rampage on the news. He finds out that Croc had attempted a similar plan and had come pretty close to taking out Batman. So, Bane decides that he should fight Croc in order to prove his worthiness. He attacks Croc and easily breaks his arm and beats him to a pulp. This leads to Croc hating Bane and vowing revenge, eventually tracking Bane to the sewers and attacking him, even ignoring a tied up Robin, favoring his revenge match over taking out one of Batman's allies. Bane beats Croc again without too much trouble, which only solidified Croc's hatred for the venom enhanced villain. Number 7. Gorilla Grodd and Deathstroke This feud began in Titans number 11, when Slade Wilson's ex-wife Addie Kane was kidnapped by Vandal Savage, causing Deathstroke to try and rescue her. He found her being held at knife point by Gorilla Grodd, who took the opportunity to cut her throat in front of him. This of course made Deathstroke swear revenge on Grodd, and when he was hired by Blockbuster, the Nightwing villain, not the movie store, to go to Gorilla City to find him a new heart in the Birds of Prey hostage heart arc, Deathstroke took the opportunity to go rogue. He ditched the other members of his team and tore a path of destruction through the jungle, searching for Grodd. In the end, Grodd got away and Deathstroke was unable to avenge his wife. In the current DC continuity, Slade's wife is alive and well, so he and Grodd really have no beef. But it's a shame we never got to see this storyline resolved before the continuity was reset. Number 6. Captain America Captain America does not hate mutants. He stands against inequality, it's one of his things, fighting for the little guy. But gosh darn it, he sure seems to not care about them or their cause. Captain America and the Avengers in general don't usually think of the whole race of mutants when they make decisions, and that often leads to catastrophic events. A prime example being Avengers vs X-Men. The X-Men knew from the very beginning that the Phoenix Force was coming to join with Hope Summers to revive the mutant species, and that if it didn't find Hope, it would destroy the Earth. They knew this because the mutant Cable went to the future, where the Avengers had succeeded in quote, protecting Hope from the Phoenix Force, and it was bad. Cyclops made this pretty clear to Captain America and the Avengers, but they didn't trust the X-Men, this group of powerful mutants with decades of experience with the Phoenix Force, and who have hosts of the Phoenix Force among their ranks. The subconscious anti-mutant prejudice that Cap holds, coupled with his self-righteousness, causes him to not trust mutants and to think that he knows better than them. It's subtle for sure, but it's there all the same. Captain America has been at the center of many debates due to his willful negligence in regards to the mutant struggle. He doesn't hate mutants, but he also takes no noticeable action in their favor, nor does he like it when the X-Men threaten to overturn the current peace, even if it's for the betterment of their own species. But he does create the Unity Squad, so there's that. Number 5. Hawkeye Look, Hawkeye is kinda just a bit of a jerk. 
to everyone. And it makes a tiny bit of sense since he's constantly playing the compensation game with everyone else since he's just a guy with a bow and an arrow. But man, does he say some problematic anti-mutant garbage sometimes. In Secret Wars, for example, without showing any anti-mutant sentiment before, Hawkeye grabs Cyclops by the scruff of his shirt and screams in his face, you mutants stick together, huh? Well, sticking to a blood-soaked maniac like him doesn't speak well of you, pal. He was referring to Magneto and, well, fair point, Hawkeye, but what's all this you mutants talk? Look, I'm reaching for this one for sure, but in the Ultimate Universe, this sentiment is actually a bit more noticeable, and Hawkeye is certainly more of a jerk in general there. And he even took glee in taking out multiples of multiple men. Although, that was most likely because he was grieving. Look, just let me have this one, okay? Number four, Scarlet Witch. The Scarlet Witch is another unique choice for this list, as she herself is indeed a mutant. But it's the fact that she is a mutant that is why she's on this list in the first place. It is a gross understatement to say that Wanda has not had the easiest life. Being an Avenger for years, the team that she has always been more inclined to anyways, this mutant saved the world on many occasions, but the end of the Scarlet Witch's marriage to Vision and the loss of her children caused a mental break. Breakdown. A breakdown that coupled with her reality warping capabilities caused the passing of a number of Avengers. Once the heroes decided that she needed to be dealt with, she warped reality to a world where Magneto was in charge of everything. But in the climax of that story, Wanda, in an extremely emotional moment, basically revealed her hate for mutants stemmed from the fact that being one has caused her so much pain and grief. She hated herself for being a mutant, and with three words, she then relieved almost all the mutants mutants on Earth of their mutant abilities, putting the entire race into endangerment. Number 3, Tony Stark. Tony Stark, Iron Man, is on this list for an extremely similar reason to Captain America. As one of the leading men in the non-mutant superhero community, he makes some rather interesting decisions with some pretty selfish intent. Just like Captain America, I wouldn't say that Tony hates mutants or the X-Men, but I would say that he is usually ignorant to the horror which the X-Men have had to endure solely for being born different. For Tony, his example of not caring comes from the superhuman Civil War. Iron Man attempted to recruit the X-Men during Civil War, and Emma Frost rightly pointed out that the Avengers did absolutely nothing when Genosha was attacked by the Sentinels. 16 million mutants passed away, and the other heroes, Iron Man included, were almost nowhere to be found. But the bigger elephant in the room is that the act that Tony is even supporting in his Civil War is the Superhuman Registration Act, which itself was just an evolution of the Mutant Registration Act that purposefully segregated mutants for being who they were born to be. Tony didn't really care about that. He cared about having powerful pawns on his side. He would rather have them on his side since they are useful to keep around, but he doesn't actually care about their struggle, and he doesn't even fully trust them. Also, an imposter Tony Stark called them all filthy muties once, so there's that. Number two, Reed Richards. Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four is not overtly a mutant or X-Men hater. The Fantastic Four that he is arguably the leader of have done their time and earned their place among the whole superhuman community, including among the mutants, as the Fantastic Four were one of the few groups who actively showed support of mutants, even if they didn't really know the best way to do so. But despite that, when things get personal, people's true colors come out for all to see. Reed may have not overtly said he hates mutants, but when it was revealed that Franklin Richards, his son, was actually a mutant, Reed then implanted a mutant nullifier into his own kid. He tried to fix Franklin despite the fact that he didn't try to do that when Franklin was not a mutant. I'd say that is pretty highly suspicious, and Susan Richards would probably agree with me. The people of the internet think this may have played a part in her trying to shack up with Namor. The worst part is Franklin wasn't actually a mutant. He just subconsciously used his vast powers to give himself an X gene. Reed needs to check himself. And finally, in at number one, the Eternals. This may be a bit of an interesting choice. The hate for the X-Men here is almost an involuntary thing. So the Eternals, a celestial created experiment and offshoot of humanity, have an eternal struggle against another offshoot, the Deviants. Eternals have hardwired programming to protect the Celestials and to correct access deviation. A recent revelation about mutants and deviants causes the new Eternal leader, a pretty sinister guy by the name of Druig, to decide that the mutants represented X 
process deviation. Thanks to that, war is declared on all mutants, including obviously the X-Men. Following their programming, Eternal Assassins come to Krakoa to destroy the Five. Massive War Machine Eternals called the Hex are unleashed on Krakoa. Uranus, one of the oldest and nastiest of the Eternals, is unleashed on Arako, and millions of mutants are taken out by the Eternals and their War Machines. Now, to be totally fair, not all Eternals are on board with that. The main heroic Eternals, like Fina and Icarus and Ajax and Makari, split themselves off as separate Eternal factions trying to fix the situation. And when it reaches its crazy huge penultimate climax, things do go back to a bit of a normalcy, but for a while, their Eternals tried to wipe out the mutants simply for existing.